Hertz Select Board to order at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, November 30th. Uh, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Is there any volunteers who'd like to do this this evening? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Larry. We have no business before us as the local control liquor, the local liquor control board this evening. What are the agenda? Anything that people want to look at? That will bring us to public comments. So, first we'll start with those. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I forgot to leave this thing about the hybrid model here. Sorry. Um, so, our meeting has come to order. This meeting is a hybrid meeting, which means that some are all of the public bodies meeting remotely, and some of the meeting, um, some are meeting physically in a previously noted location, which is here. The public may attend to observe, listen, and participate contemporaneously. One member of the public body is here. Other staff is present at the location to ensure the public can participate if needed. Please note, while uh, we are while we strive to provide means for those attending remotely to participate in in the public comment period, there may be technical difficulties or reasons that otherwise prevent or interrupt remote public participation. Therefore, it's important to note that the open meeting law only ensures the public's right to participate and comment at a public meeting by attending at the designated physical location as posted in the notice and agenda, which is here. Remember, the public or the public body has um, technical difficulties and refer to the agenda tonight, which has the contact information on how to get in touch with people. Sorry, I forgot to read that at the beginning. Okay, um, so now let's go over to public comment. So as is the procedure, we will have someone, we'll start with people in the room and then we'll go to people online. And we uh, ask that you please state your name, your town of residence, you have up to five minutes to speak. So if there's anyone in the room that would like to come up. Mary, go ahead. Can I ask for justice? Uh, it, up or down if you want to, I think it'll probably pick up. Okay. I would like to thank the select board. For sorry, the work. can you state your name? Oh, and your sorry, that's okay. Good yeah. thing. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, Mary, you said Mary, so I just assume. Uh, my name is Mary Erdai, and I'm from Wilder. I would like to thank the select board for the work that you do here and during the meetings and committees that you attend. Like many businesses, schools, hospitals, and government offices, there are rules of etiquette or codes of conduct under which we must operate to be effective and efficient. You, our select board, and the other town officers like Tracy, perform an essential role in this community and the public, like me, need to understand that your responsibility is to work toward improving the business of the town's residents, but you also provide opportunities for the public to engage in town business discussions. It is because of this latter objective engaging public commentary that I have come here before you tonight. While attending meetings here recently, my concerns have been drawn to the lack of a code of conduct exhibited in this space. Some members of the public have directed personal attacks toward the chair of this board with no thought to the decorum necessary to transact town business. I feel strongly that the public needs to be reminded of what their code or their conduct must be if the officers in charge are to preserve order and accomplish much. I understand that the Hartford Select Board Rules of Procedure established and adopted May 7th, 2019 states that the public, quote, is afforded reasonable opportunity to express opinions about matters considered by the body so long as order is maintained. It also states, quote, members of the public are prohibited from making personal, impertinent, threatening, or profane remarks. Twice in the last several months, I have heard a few public members make personal attacks. And in fact, on November 16th, two weeks ago, the result of a personal attack prompted a question from board member Kim Souza asking the speaker, quote, is this a threat? The chair of the board ensures, quote, that meetings are run professionally and all participants behave civilly with no personal attacks. I have watched Dan maintain civil discourse with that speaker and another at a different meeting when their inappropriate attacks were directed toward him in a confrontational manner. The public need to know that it is the chair's duty to keep the select board on track to control the meeting to ensure that procedures are followed by all members of the board, as well as all participants at the meeting. 
The chair cannot do this job if some members of the public lack decorum and civil discourse. The Handbook for Vermont Select Board, established and adopted by the state of Vermont in April 2006, states that, quote, the most effective select boards are those that make the best use of their meeting time and resources. As a taxpayer in our community, I want the board to make the best use of meeting times and resources. We teach our children that their actions have consequences, so we need to hold adults to the same interactions and standards. Yes, we have a right to express an opinion, but rights come with responsibilities. We voters elect people to do the business of the town, not so we can demean or berate some person's character. Noam Chomsky, 93-year-old internationally known American linguist, philosopher, historian, and cognitive scientist, among other roles, gave a talk via Zoom at Dartmouth this fall, and he answered the student-generated question about our freedoms with this comment, quote, we do not have the freedom to do harm to others, end quote. In light of these recent personal attacks, I wonder if public speakers need a reminder of their responsibilities prior to speaking or addressing the board. Perhaps small three by five cards might be handy near where the public signs in to attend listing the procedures to follow before one speaks. Or perhaps the board could keep a tighter rein on the time allotment, five minutes, granting an extension only as the board sees fit to do so. I support the select board's use of procedures to get business done so they can make policies that are responsive to us all. Thank you. And I hope that was under five minutes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Anyone else in the room like to make a comment? My name is Carrie O'Neill. I've lived here for 63 years in the town of Hartford. You just said everything I came here to, uh, in my opinion, I, I get emotional because I've heard people attack people and it's not right. I am here to support everybody up there and I'm with all of you and your decisions. That's it. Thank you. Carrie says it's better. <laughs> Anyone else in the room have a comment? Oh. Good evening. My name is Heidi Duto and I'm from White River Junction. Please help me to understand something as I am very frustrated. I have brought before this board and the town manager the ordinances and laws governed by RVs within the town of Hartford many times. My perception is that you continue to ignore these rules and that you've known about them for, very, for a very long time. What faith do I and other citizens of the town of Hartford have that you will enforce the rules that the vice chair has asked for regarding the building of these structures by Simon Dennis. <clears throat> Why ask for more rules when you know, when you as a town carry these existing ordinances and rules that are in place? It was stated that the health officer had informed the parties involved in the municipal lot that they would be required to move at some point. Much time has passed since that time. Required, regardless of the signs or not, those folks know that they have to move. All I've heard is that you are waiting for signs, signs. And to me, this is just an excuse to again, not follow the existing ordinances. When and if those arrive, is it my perception that everything that has taken place, that the town will again choose not to follow the rules on the signs, or there will be some other emotionally attached reason to not follow the rules?
after watching the previous meeting videos again, I did not hear it actually voided to wait until the signs arrived. It was discussed, but never voted. Yes, no one wants to be the bad guy, but I certainly don't want to be made out to be the bad witch that does not care about people. But when you look at the laws, they're either followed or not. Very simple. We are doing a discredit to the town by allowing that this eyesore to remain and have visitors to our town see this. Again, please explain to me why you choose to not follow the ordinance currently in place. Are you done? Yes, okay. sir. All right, have a seat, thanks. I have a couple more things that I'll- Okay, like then go ask. ahead, you need to do it now. Go ahead and share everything and then we'll address your questions. There's a couple more articles, not this one. Okay, you have two more minutes. I'd also like to go on to the topic that she addressed. A couple weeks ago, I came to you on the topic of how you approached Mr. Lane Collins. And I personally, Mr. Chair, at the last meeting, two meetings ago, would like to know how my statement that I asked by one of your board members was perceived as a threat. That's my question. Is that all you have? You have one more minute if you'd like to share anything else and then we'll answer your questions. I would like to know where within my statement is there an implication or perception of a threat such as my voice to me by the board member? Yes, sir. Are you done? Yes, sir. Okay, can have a seat. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. Um, thanks, Heidi. I definitely. Um, intuitively emotionally felt a uh, animosity and that the, just the phrase is we're watching you we're on to you I mean by all means fully support I mean one of the reasons I'm sitting on this board is because I was also frustrated and had um, and the board wasn't moving in the direction that I wanted it to and I ran for election and was voted in to be here who knows what will happen in the future. Um, so the, we're watching you, we see you, we're doing this, that, that to me was a perception of a threatening, um, threatening language. I may have misperceived it. I apologize if I did. Um, I encourage you to pursue, I, mean, I know it's frustrating. I have sat at the, I've stood at that podium also prior to being on the board and still can be frustrated on the board. I know I have a, I don't know how you're feeling, but I can empathize to some extent and it is, it's really frustrating. But my perception of what your tone was and the phrases you were saying felt threatening to me. Not, not that you were threatening me, but threatening the chair. So I apologize if I misperceived that. Anyone else? Dennis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I sat here and, you know, heard Mrs. Miss Dudo as well, and I guess I didn't take that as a threat. I'm, to be here, I feel I have to have pretty thick skin, unless somebody says, you know, you're a jerk or you're a so-and-so or something like that. 
I can handle most about anything that gets shot at us. So that's my take on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to respond on the first. I, I don't think it's my place to respond to the second. Um, Ms. Duto does bring up some interesting things in her statement about the, the uh, RV that's down to the municipal lot. Um, she's right, and we have to acknowledge that, that we are not upholding ordinances as a town by the parking ordinances um, allowing that RV to stay down there. We're not, we're not upholding ordinances. And we have been made aware of the ordinances many times by Ms. Duto and the brought girl before us. And <clears throat> she's right that it was stated that the uh, health officer had gone down and talked to these people and stated they would have to move at some point in time. So she's right on that. And I can understand where she's saying that there's people in the town of Hartford that are beginning to lose faith in us carrying out the duties that we're supposed to be doing if we're not responding to these things that we're seeing in the town. There's a, I can see her perception that we're not doing our jobs. And um, some days I, I feel frustrated because I don't see us doing our jobs as well. And we need to take the emotion out of the aspect of the situation and we need to address it from a right and a wrong aspect. And are we holding the laws or are we not holding the laws? And we're not holding laws. And we may have talked about the, the signs, but I was not aware that we were in such a delay to get the signs for down there. And the signs may be delayed, and delayed until December or January, and it's gonna be a really cold, cold period of time. And are we gonna fall back and say that we can't move them because of the cold period of time? <clears throat> we in the town and as a board in the past, I've seen it on the other side of the aisle, have based a lot of decisions on emotions. And emotions have a point in all of our lives, but we also have to uphold the ordinances and the laws and the rules that we've put in place or the others before us have put in place. And I agree that we're not doing them. And we go to all the work of getting this information about what the Mr. Simon Dennis is doing. Are we gonna be able to enforce those rules or are we gonna have something for a reason that we're not gonna be able to enforce? I think it's, does it, it does it just, it does a disservice to the town when we don't do what we're supposed to be doing. I, I don't feel we're doing the correct thing here. Thank you. Let's go down the line, Joe. Um, consistency is probably the most important thing for me. And during that particular uh, segment, we said that we would not enforce this until the signs came. Now, if we didn't say that, I, I would say absolutely, that, that you're absolutely right. But we, whether it was right or wrong, we, we made the commitment that we wouldn't until the signs were there. Um, obviously, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone here thought that the supply chain will, would be as bad as it is right now. Um, the consistency is the most important thing. And if you're absolutely right, Lanny, we need to enforce laws. But if we give if we give our word, which we did that night, we agreed that, that we would not enforce this until the signs came. And, and, and in hindsight is always 2020. And we, we probably should not have done that. But that's what we said. You know, that that at that point now, if we want to make another motion. And, and go back, but I always want to be consistent in anything that we say or do. And at that point, we said that we would not enforce that ordinance until those signs came. So um, if you want to bring them another motion to say, to, to renege on that, that's one thing. And, and, and we can go forward on that. But the consistency and for this board not to be hypocritical when we say we're going to do something is, is the most important thing to me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Joe. Mike, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I agree with Joe about uh, consistency. Um, you know, a lot, not a lot of people, probably less than 
And I'd like to see, you know, really follow us closely and know all the ordinances we passed. So I think the idea of waiting till we had signs was important um, as a way to just give people further notice of, of their conduct and, and what the possible consequences are. Um, so, you know, you say you got to wait till the signs, the signs take longer than we think. I, you know, I mean, I think we just have to, to stay with what we said. Also, you know, we hear a lot about permitted and unpermitted structures. And frankly, I don't believe the select board is the body that um deals with that it's not, i believe that's planning and zoning so i think these are these are perfectly legitimate questions about permitted structures or unpermitted but you know they should be addressed i think to um planning and zoning thanks thanks thank you mike ali do you have anything you want to add ali joining us from zoom if people weren't aware i know my comments have been shared thank you okay thanks so i want to clarify a few things too so, oh sorry kim I guess I just want to echo um, we, we last winter we had significant issues with towing that happened in that lot because there there was no parking ordinance at that time or none that addressed the issues we were having and it caused several community members it cost them several thousand dollars it was an upset and it was that experience that I think um, led us to the discussion that we should not enforce this until the signage is available. And I, I felt like there was an awareness of supply chain interruption. I mean, I think that was at the beginning of November or something, not, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and, but I think one of the things that um, Heidi Duto might be referencing is the RV ordinance, which is separate from the, the which was discussed at the planning commission last night. Um, so that may be a separate matter that doesn't that isn't applicable to the parking ordinance. I still fully stand by the, the decision to not enforce the parking ordinance until there is signage available for the people that park there to know what the rules are. Um, and if the if the current RV regulations are being violated, then I if it, we are not an enforcing st structure like this is we don't the select board members do not enforce the ordinances of the town. That is the, the channels of whoever the enforcing body is for that ordinance. Um, ideally, with our um, uh, adoption of our plan on plans, or I mean, our policy on policies, pardon me, not plans on plans, our policy on policies is that every policy and ordinance that the town has will also include who's responsible for enforcing those policies and who's responsible and accountable for updating them and those kind of things. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. So a couple other question uh, comments I want to make. Um, so we don't always officially vote on something, but we have a, a general consensus that we ask the town manager to carry out certain things. So there isn't always an official vote that happens. I think it's pretty clear from the recollection of people that spoke that that was the indication. And for the reasons that Kim stated about the fiasco with parking last year, we didn't want to have a repeat of that by having people be upset and be unclear about what the policies were that were in place. Again, to address some of Lanny's concerns, if you have something that you want to do, any member of this board can make a motion that is then seconded and voted on to carry on to change the direction of what is happening, what we ask the town manager to do, which then turns around and asks the staff and the proper departments to do. And as Kim said, we don't, we don't enforce the policy. People bring things to us, we discuss them, we make a motion, we ask, we ask Tracy to carry it out and she carries it out with the bodies of people involved and, and it's up to them. So it's not us that, that is not enforcing these rules. We have brought that to the proper channels and town and those procedures. And you know, with the supply chain and with the lack of staffing, I think those are some of the issues, but they've been brought up several times. They are now with the people that are aware of what should be happening. And we're just waiting to hear back from them is my understanding. Well, Kim. just to be correct, I, I'm sorry, just to be correct, it's a terrible phrase, but to clarify, I don't think in this particular case, it's not up to us to direct the town manager to direct staff to enforce the law. It's if members of the community, unless by all means, if an individual member of the board wants to go to planning and zoning and report a violation as an individual member of the community, I think that's perfectly appropriate. But I don't think it's up to us to direct the town manager to direct planning and zoning to go enforce violations, that is up to a complaint being filed. This is what I think, I'm not 100% positive, but if a member of the community would need to file a complaint and then that violation could be addressed. Does that sound correct to you? 
Yeah, the enforcement officers get complaints and investigate those complaints, record their their conclusion on on a case, and either proceed or close it, depending on their promotional assessment. So it's not going to go from public comment to select board to town manager to staff. It needs to go from community member to staff to the violation. Thank you for clarifying. So I just want to be sure that when people come up here that, that they don't think that we're not hearing them, which is the indication that I was getting. So what I was trying to say was that we as a body hear that, but we don't make those decisions. We can we can make sure that the town manager is aware of that. And as you said, they can go directly or that can be followed up that way, which quite often is the way that Tracy handles it. She said, I will let the proper parties involved be aware and get back to you. So I just want to make sure that people didn't feel like they weren't being heard was the question. Yes, Lane. I, I completely agree with Joe and Mike, that we need to have a, a standard that we follow. I completely agree with that. But I do believe that Ms. Dodo was referring to the RV uh, statute that was in place. And now it's a statute that I believe that we have not <coughs> enforced. And I just, I don't know if it's because of the lack of the manpower that we have in the town currently or what the current situation is. But I know that the RV has been reported to uh, the planning and zoning department, I believe. And while I can't say that I know for a fact, but I believe it's been reported to planning and zoning. And I I haven't seen any action on it, nor the people that I that I perceive have reported on that. So I'm not sure who does a follow-up, if we can ask the town manager to follow up on it or how, how it gets known to us uh, as a board that there's a follow-up in regards to a, a citizen's complaint. There should be something that 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 comes back to us to say that, you know, this is being looked at. I don't see anything now that allows us to know. I mean, if somebody knows it, if somebody does know how that happens, please let me know. But I mean, we are the, the board that is supposed to take care of citizens. I think the clarification that we received both from Tracy and Kim kind of addressed some of that, but generally speaking, when, when Tracy has an update on something that's brought before, she does share that, um, you know, or we can specifically ask if there's an update on that. And, you know, I'm sure she'll answer if she has one, you know, when there have been other questions before about things. So I think that that chain is being followed. I think it's just slow in the process. So, so. Can, I, can I ask, okay, have you heard anything from putting a zoning in regards to I uh, haven't. I haven't. Um, much of the staff took extra time off during Thanksgiving because they were able to see their families, and um, I haven't had a chance to check in with planning and zoning on this. Can, can we ask uh, if you can possibly check in and see if there's been any progress made on that? Yeah, they stage? also were pretty busy last night was that big planning commission meeting, but yeah. um, I can check in with planning yeah. and zoning, and um, you all are right. Uh, if, if somebody comes to you or me and they don't have a a great amount of information. We can't really do anything. I just forward those information along to people who actually do have that process in place. Do you know if there's, if, is there something that's supposed to be in place that allows us to, to know what's happening? I mean, other than you? Well, I mean, to back up, there's a little bit of a privacy thing about people who might be getting complaints against their property, which could be any of the seven of you as well. Um, and so typically those aren't really shared publicly as some sort of like, a data portal to see what sort of things are going on, especially when it comes to fire prevention and the health officer, those can be pretty sensitive topics. We're dealing with often like mental health crises, um, children, elderly welfare, um, things like that. So in terms of that, that's kind of a sticky situation um, to say we're gonna provide public access to every complaint because um, a lot of those would be pretty heavily redacted in terms of address and personal information. Um, and, you know, I, just if we wanted to go there, we would probably want to do some deep thinking about what that actually looked like in terms of releasing every complaint um, ever lodged against anyone in the town. I understand there's a different, there is a different level though between public access that information and select board access that information. I so, still want to check on that. To be a different level and we can see what's happening. So, Probably want y'all to formally vote on that one too, just so we had it on the record. <laughs> there are hands up. Yeah. Hey, can you bring over Kathy Melistic, please? Hi, Kathy Melisic from Wilder, Vermont. Um, one of your regulars, I guess. <laughs> um, I am hoping that the select board can do whatever is possible and permissible to help 
um, protect our historic resources. Um, now, especially with regard to the application for demolition of the structures at 160 Gate Street, which is up for a planning commission meeting on December 6th. Um, I, I also wanted to say I was, I was appalled to read in the paper of the interstate and multiple municipalities manhunt, or rather dog hunt by Norwich police. Um, which apparently involved the request for and required provision of personal information by Hartford staff to find the owner of a dog that killed some chickens. Um, I, I feel awful for the owner of the chickens. Um, I, you know, I, I was just shocked to read that this was a priority by a neighboring town, part of our Upper Valley community. Um, I'm hoping too that the same zeal that was, um, expressed by Norwich representatives with this will be directed to their projects for affordable housing, which would also help alleviate some of the discussion earlier happening tonight. Um, and finally, I would really like to express as with the women who spoke earlier, um, my appreciation for the members of the board for all that they do, particularly in the face of some very public and often personal attacks um, and some a good chunk of misinformation on social media as various groups and sites pop up here and there. Um, I know, for example, that, um, you know, everybody sitting on the board is actually a resident of the town of Hartford. Um, things saying that wasn't true have been posted online along with other misinformation. And I'm, I'm really sorry that you all have to go through this. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for what you do and, um, and to know that you are appreciated even if we don't always agree with you. <laughs> and thank you all very much. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, can you bring over Brian Horan? And when you're there, go ahead. Sorry, what? Um, yeah, so Brian, we'll come back to you um, and hopefully get the technical difficulties worked out, whether yeah. it's on your end or on. So who's up next? Uh, Mike Morris. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, Mike Morris. Go ahead. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the board. Uh, Mike Morris, Hartford, Vermont. Um, I'm sitting here watching and listening. Um, Joe, you brought up some very good points about being consistent with what we say we're going to do and, and uh, standing by it. Um, I have some concerns about how we've handled ordinance enforcements in the past. Uh, I'll give an example where. I had a uh, property maintenance business mowing my lawn that put a sign on my lawn advertising for them. And it wasn't a short time that I got a phone call and was told to remove the sign because I was in violation of an ordinance advertising for somebody else. Um, that's just one little example. Are we consistent in enforcing our ordinances is my biggest problem. I think that what uh, Heidi has been bringing up and presenting to the board in the town um, is legit in many ways, but I do not believe, me personally, we have enforced these ordinances the way we have in the past. I can say I personally have called down to the zoning office and questioned about uh, things related to uh, the, the uh, uh, shelters being around town. And at one point I was told I needed to contact the town manager's office. That's an abnormal, not a normal thing to do. We need to be consistent from beginning to end, not just um, on this one thing about the signage, which I hear what you're coming from. Um, it, I think this is an unusual situation. It's unique. It's hit us at a terrible time with COVID. And I'm trying to understand all sides of this to be fair with everybody. But I do think the town has been reluctant to enforce their ordinances in the normal manner that they have in the past. And I would ask that we come up with some consistency 
with that as a general rule, period. And uh, so we don't have these types of things happening. And uh, the question's coming up where I, um, trying to be careful about how I say this. I don't want there to be distrust. I don't want there to be lack of transparency perceptions. I, I want us to all be on the same boat together and work together here and get things done. But I do think in this particular era uh, situation with, with the, the, the huts that are being built and whatever, shelters, however you want to call them, we have not dealt with it in the normal manner that we would have in the past. So I'm asking again, Joe, I, I support you. We need to be consistent. And I really hope that we try to do that. Uh, it would help out in many ways for perception, uh, understanding, and um, fairness. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Is it Martin, can you try Brian again? Brian, if you can unmute. Are you there, Brian? Do you have unmuted? Yeah. It seems like you might be muted on your end, Brian. So, so try. Yeah. There's a cat as well. Kathy, is your hand still up? Or is it just the same Kathy or different Kathy? It's the same Kathy. Oh, she lowered her hand. Okay. Oh, okay. So, okay. We're good. And we'll just. Okay, so Brian, we weren't able to somehow figure out how to get you over um, with the technological oh. difference. Oh, I mean, you did for a second. <laughs> you almost had it. So whatever you did, just try it one more time. Okay, so why don't you send us an email or something um, and, and check in with us a different way and we'll try and get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay, any select board comments on stuff that we heard from the presidents? Dennis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last evening, I think Kim alluded to it earlier, there was a meeting here on the, on the possible RV changes to zoning regulations. And uh, one thing that I thought I'd point out that's been asked is, uh, I think we heard at the last select board meeting that there's no need, this was a citizen's comment, that there's no need for the RVs or any of this because the hotel thing has been opened up to all. So I asked this last night at that meeting and uh, they said that some people don't want to live in motels, hotels for personal reasons, privacy, whatever. And then some, I guess, have been kicked out of hotels and so forth. So I don't have any place to go. So I guess that, that, explained a little bit for me more why that we are talking about RVs and campers and so forth that I didn't know until last month. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Kim, go ahead. Can I, just, I just want to add to that. Um, but one of the other responses was too, that even though this has been a super incredibly valuable um, temporary solution, it's definitely not a permanent solution. Not that necessarily RV regulation modification would be a permanent uh, but there is going to come a time when those vouchers will not be funded. Um, and there probably will come a time when less motels want to participate as well. I think they're looking forward to, um, to becoming guest motels again as well. So it was also like it is an amazing temporary solution, but it's definitely not a permanent long term solution. else right, let's go into select board comments or announcements i'm sorry i thought that's where we were that's, that's okay did did I also, it's sort of automatically flow from, from you know, i'm sorry like if the I comments about with the public into that but that was a nice segue so that's fine thank you uh, anyone else comments uh, i just want to um give a shout out that the energy commission is looking for more members so they have a quorum so if you're interested um you can reach out to molly smith who is the president of that um subcommittee uh, and I also want to remind people that today is Giving Tuesday. So if you know a nonprofit that's your favorite, give to them. <laughs> um, so every Tuesday. I know, make it every Tuesday. All right, so that will bring us to appointments of which we have none. So we'll go over to the town manager for your report. When you're ready, Tracy, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Hi, everybody. I know we have a big agenda plan. Thank you all for bearing with us. We just keep adding more stuff for all of us to talk about every few days. Um, so I'm going to skim this over quickly. Uh, you know, we we got some requests for some information on advanced transit. Uh, Van was kind enough to write out some information. I don't know if everybody heard, but Van is retiring. Um, so we're going to miss him terribly. And he also is taking some time off this month uh, for some personal reasons. So um, he did provide some light information. Uh, I learned a lot about this. Uh, for example, municipal contributions are less than 20% of the cost of services for AT. I, I thought they were much more municipally driven than that. Um, and one of the other fun facts that I found out that Van um, provided with uh, me with was that um, they really count their ridership on uh, the stops that they get on and off. Uh, we know that that our neighbors across the river, West Lebanon, have a lot of the big box stores that we don't have, including that brand new sparkling Target and Sierra complex over there. Um, and so they really count their ridership in terms of where people get on and off, knowing that they're often providing a service for our more rural uh, residents to go over there and uh, get all of their good good Target energy, um, good PetSmart stuff and all their BJ's needs. Um, thank you, West Lebanon, for uh, keeping those box stores over on that side of the river. Uh, and so if you all have any questions or um, want more information, please let me know. I'm always happy to have more conversations with Van. He's great on the phone. Um, other than that, you know, we I have had the opportunity to get out and do a little bit more of that bigger town managing stuff. Uh, the child care symposium uh, was much more um, less depressing the second session than the first session. The first session had to do with a lot of uh, disparities in what we can provide. Um, I am very thankful to uh, Sean, uh, the city manager from Lebanon, who had some really interesting, innovative work that he's doing in his role. Um, to help uh, make them an attractive workplace for parents and caregivers. So I'm excited to uh, think over some of those things and see where we can, can do that work uh, for um, our employees who are parents and caregivers or those who would like to come join us and work for the town of Hartford, who is a parent or a caregiver. Um, thank you to Emily and the team at the Hartford Community Coalition for their annual board meeting. Um, I think that there are some amazing worker bees over there and they just get a lot done with very little. Um, and uh, I also got a chance to meet with the field director of the Vermont Agency of Human Services for our region. Uh, Will had some great design uh, ideas and he's actually, uh, we're meeting with some staff from Norwich University and Laurie Hirschfield in the coming weeks to discuss uh, some more information about ADUs. So we just finally got that on the books. Um, to look at more of these ideas of having pre, pre-approved, pre-planned ADUs that you can pick out of a catalog, so to speak, and get on your land and add some more housing. Um, in terms of significant activities, uh, not a not a ton to report. Just uh, the same old, the same old, same old. In that we're just keep on going. We've got all the holiday stuff going, um, and we continue to be out and about, responding to calls, uh, getting ready for winter and uh, keeping everything going. So I'm happy to entertain questions, but I, I know we got a long night ahead of us. So also happy to move on to cannabis. Any good? Yeah, I, I still like to follow up on my questions that I uh, sent you for advanced transit. I'd like those questions answered. So if you can email those to uh, Van, I'd appreciate that. I follow up on that. Okay, so you, you want like, I'll, I'll Relook at your specific questions and ask him to specifically answer them yes. rather than providing what he provided. Okay. Yes, specifically those questions. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask is that I just saw, I can't remember where I saw that, but that the Emerald Ash Borer has been found in Hartford. Um, and do you know anything about that from our tree board or anything? I don't. The tree board works for y'all, so that would be a little bit of a thing. Um, our Parks and Rec director is the liaison, um, but he's out this week. Okay. I just like to know that we're uh, on top of trying to. I know we can't control that, but uh, I don't know if there's even any mitigation. But um, aware of it, and 
tracking where it's going to travel, I guess. I just, it's, it's a terrible thing to have happen to the town. And I just hope we can some way do something. Uh, As the liaison to that board, I can tell you that they had a plan in place. Again, like anything, it's money. So if you look at all the, all the trees in town, we don't have the money to cover them. So they sort of tried to prioritize what would happen. But again, I think as the cost of supplies, gasoline, some of it, um, you know, if they had to cut trees has increased so much, I'm not sure what we can do and whether how many of those individuals, again, are available to hire as it's in our region, everyone's even looking at the same services. So there is a plan in place. Um, and again, it depends upon how fast um, that, that changes, but, you know, we're just, we're going with what we have each day. It was just discovered yesterday. So, um, you know, as people are out in that department, um, we're just trying to figure out how to the best way forward. So we don't have a lot of answers at this time, but people are aware of it. And previous to this, there was a plan in place for when it came. So they have some ideas as to how to handle it, but no specific yet. You are aware of that. Yes. Yes. Okay. And we probably shouldn't be told where it happened at the town of probably will be better off. I don't know if that's public anymore. information or if it will become public. I didn't even know until earlier today that it was actually Hartford. It just said Windsor County. So, so it's become more specific and whether that is released, I'm not sure. So, thank you. Just to add to that, what you just said, um, we had a briefing from the tree person, tree board committee or something on this two or three years ago. And it seemed like a no-win situation. If the, the, the way to kill the bug is to go around and cut all the ash trees down, but we, it, it's how do you win that war? The only way to, to, to stop it is to kill the, to cut the trees down, eliminate the bug. So, I don't know. We just can't win that one. Okay. Um, I guess we are ready for cannabis. Would you bring Kimberly Gilbert over, please? Thank you. Documentation on that site, but like he didn't get me. Kimberly did not provide anything for you guys to read ahead of time. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Kimberly Gilbert, and I'm a regional planner at the Two Rivers Ataquichi Regional Commission. And uh, part of my work there is done with our partners at the Mount Escutney Prevention Partnership. Uh, working on efforts like and including uh, health related goals, policies, recommendations uh, at the town level. And today I was asked to come to share some information about Act 164. So I'll just quickly go through some considerations to make when thinking about uh, incoming retail cannabis in towns. I have a presentation I'll put up on my screen share. All right. Thanks. Um, just quickly, some basics from one act from Act 164. It will legalize retail sale of adult use cannabis. Um, it created the Cannabis Control Board at the state level to regulate uh, the adult use cannabis business in the state. Retail sales may begin in October of of 2022. Um, 21 and up to purchase. Um, most importantly for tonight's conversation is the idea of opting, opting in. Towns can vote to opt in to the retail sale of recreational cannabis. Uh, for timeline, towns can choose to hold their vote to opt in or not at any time. Um, this can be done at town meeting or at a, a special me meeting. Um, to place the vote. Uh, it's not recommended to do so until the state level cannabis control board has established the regulations. They're, they're actively working on this um, couple meetings a week to get all this taken care of. Um, retail locations with integrated licenses can begin to sell as soon as May 1st and then retail licenses can be issued starting in October. The, here's just some info on the cannabis control board the state group that's meeting to set regulations. They post their agendas, meetings, minutes, video online at this website. They're establishing regulations for 
everything, every part of the process from cultivators to wholesalers to retailers. And so towns are starting to um, wonder how to, how to go about this. How does this work with the timeline at the state? What can be done at the town level? And some things to consider would be then how do, how do you start these town conversations? What do residents in town think about having retail cannabis? What do businesses think about it? Uh, what's the best way for community conversations to happen before a, a vote? That way people can um, know what they're voting on. And one good way to go about this that we've seen is um, the way the town of Woodstock did it. They really wanted to have their residents be informed, um, hold some community discussions some conversations, do some research prior to a vote. So they created a, a cannabis research committee working group. Um, and this was made up of volunteer members uh, were part of this committee and they had uh, representatives from fields of safety, health, schools, planning. And they would meet about once a week to just dive into different topics. Um, they, their objective, they remained objective and neutral. They weren't make any, making any recommendations to the select board or the, to the trustees. They were really just trying to gather um, information within the town. And one way they did this was by creating a town survey. And so here's just some examples of the kinds of questions that they asked. And so they did this town survey to really get a feel on what kind of things people in town wanted to, to learn more about, to hear more about. And from that, they gathered their top kind of top topics that people were interested in, and they planned to hold some community information sessions. I think some of their top um, interested topics were things like tourism, taxation, health, and youth. Um, about the vote itself, so a town does have to vote to opt in in order for retail cannabis establishments to operate. And this will be done by Australian ballot, can be at annual or special meeting warned for that purpose. Um, the, the question can go by onto the ballot by the select board or through the signature collection process. And then if opt-in is the favorable choice, then the, at the town level, it can work to establish the local regulations. And that would be done through the formation of a local cannabis control commission. And so that is actually optional, creating that local commission. Um, but it is recommended because if the town chooses to opt in, if the vote takes place and the town does opt in, but does not create a local cannabis control commission, then um, licensing is just done through the state board. But if the town has their own local cannabis control commission, then uh, licensing will go through the town level first. So if opted in, municipalities may develop regulations and license, licensing requirements for the, themselves as a town, um, establish density rules, permitting fees. And uh, there is also an option that if, if a town opts in, they can in the future hold another vote and opt out in the future. But then um, the, if any existing retail operations had already begun during the opt opted in period, they would uh, be granted legacy rights and allowed to continue operation. And um, something a municipality cannot do is establish zoning rules that would basically prohibit the establishment of these retail businesses if they had voted to opt in. And so some recommended next steps, if opting in, would be to establish that local cannabis control commission just to maintain some of that local control and um, to review what kind of existing regulations are already in place in Hartford. And if the town so desires, if the community wants to consider strengthening or expanding regulations. Um, so about the local cannabis control commission, this would be at the town level. Uh, a municipality that does choose to host the establishment, cannabis establishments, 
can can make this local control commission not required but recommended um, they would be able to issue and administer control licenses and um, could also suspend or revoke local licenses for violating any of the conditions placed upon the license and some go back for a second the town could consider um like the town of Woodstock, for example, that put in all that research and work um, beforehand. So they have not held a vote, town of Woodstock, but they've um, decided that they will be holding a vote in March and they are already forming their local cannabis control commission now ahead of time, just to get these regulations, um, you know, get working on it, get a head start, get them in place at the town level before October 2022 rolls around and the state would be able to start issuing those licenses. So if um, if the, the opt-in is defeated at the vote in March, the town will just dissolve this commission, but they are um, getting, getting a head start on forming that group now. And then we have a slide here that's just got a list of some policy options and um, ways the town could go about setting their own regulations using things like tools like zoning or ordinances and um, also dipping into town plans, health chapter, town health and wellness committees, any kind of group formation um, who would be interested in, in working on this kind of work. Uh, we do have assistance available. This is my own information from the Regional Planning Commission. And then Alice Stewart, who I work with on these kind of efforts from the Mount Escutney Prevention Partnership. And then specifically in Hartford, the Hartford Community Coalition um, is beginning this process. Like I was talking about holding those town community conversations to, to get a feel for how the town feels about this, what the town wants to do. Um, they are holding their town hall community conversation on December 13th. And so there's the information for that. And so basically it comes down to just recommending that um, these, communi these community conversations discussions start happening sooner rather than later, especially if the town is wanting to try to stick to a town meeting day vote um, that's coming up pretty soon. So just getting the conversations going, maybe doing a survey, forming a working group. And if ultimately um, the way the conversation goes is to form that local cannabis control commission, um, that is what we think uh, is, is a good way forward um, to get all the town discussion going and maintain some of that local control when it comes to licensing if this is something that the town decides to put on the ballot and decides to vote for. That's everything on my slides. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Maybe you'll be able to hang in with us for a little bit if there's some questions. Yeah. Thank you. We'll start with the board. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Thanks, Kimberly. I just have a few questions. First, have any towns uh, already voted to opt in? Yes, um, I'm not sure about statewide, but uh, I know at least in our region, in the Two Rivers region, um, Randolph and Stratford, have okay. that, so they have opted in. And they'll, okay, that, that's good to know. Um, and I take it like the local cannabis control board is sort of like, we act as like the local liquor control board. Is that sort of the idea? We would review applications. Um, I guess my other question, you, you may not know this, but is there any talk in Montpelier about amending the act in any way to let towns that do not have a 1% local sales tax um, generate some revenue from the sale of cannabis? Right. So that has come up at the, the cannabis control board meetings. There has been talk because as it stands now, any tax revenue from these sales is going back to the state um, to, to use in their programs. Um, and so there has, it, I know it has been brought up on whether this local tax option would be allowed um, in the future, but at, as of now, that is not the case, but I'm not sure if 
that will end up happening or not. It, and the, the timeline is just so interesting because they are really trying to crank these regulations out at the state level um, pretty quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just one thing to, to keep in mind. I know in an initial draft of the bill before it was enacted, I think there was the opportunity for ta towns to assess either a one or 2% cannabis tax um you know hartford we have a local option tax but it doesn't include the one percent sales tax likely because we're on the border um with new hampshire um so i think that's definitely something just to keep in mind in the town because you know if we do uh proof if the town does approve on there will be costs associated you know increased traffic travel things like that and if we really can't uh, recoup any revenue, I think that would be um, unfortunate. So that's something I'll be watching for as we have these discussions uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Kim. Okay, thanks, Kimberly. Um, the, in one of the very, or I guess one question would be, is that slide deck you just presented available um, on the Two Rivers website or would you be able to send that to us? I, I don't believe it's posted, but I will definitely send it, yes. Be much appreciated. And I think it was one of the early slides, like the second or third, where it mentioned that their sales could happen as soon as May 2022, but licensing was not until October 2022. Right. So uh, the one that would that could potentially begin in May is um, an integrated license. So an existing medical establishment, an existing medical cannabis sales establishment um, could begin doing retail sales as early as May, but a fully retail establishment, those licenses would not begin to be granted until October. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed that. Um, I think you answered my other questions already. They, I guess the last one I had is if, if we don't decide to if we choose to not move forward on this now, there isn't any reason we couldn't put it on a future ballot in 2023 or 2024, correct? That, that is correct. There is no um, time limit to, to hold a vote to opt in, correct? Excellent, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Kimberly. Um, just one question I guess I have, and you may or may not be able to answer this question is, has there been any research or thought Put into place as far as if the sale of recreational cannabis will affect a town's insurance in any way or from a liability standpoint or that is not one i am sure about actually no do not have the answer to that one i can um see what kind of conversation has been going about that. I would really like to know if there's yeah. some impact upon how insurance is dealt with. I think, and the town manager can correct me if I'm wrong, we're insured through the uh, League of Vermont City and Towns. The VLCT passive, yeah. Yeah, so it, it would be interesting to, if maybe your group could reach out to VLTC, I'm sure there's other towns within the state of Vermont that are insured through them. And I would like to know if there is a bearing upon our insurance uh, if we allow retail cannabis. Uh, that's a big question for me. Right. I can follow up on that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Dennis, go ahead. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Yes, as we, I'm just looking at you on our TV, on the my private TV here, I guess. <laughs> um, did I, when when you were going through your slides, did you say that if we opt not opt into this, that some uh, a retail outfit could apply directly to the state. No, so it, the the opt in vote decides whether retail establishments are allowed in town or not, and so that totally depends on the vote. The licensing, then, um, it it the town ups in and creates a local commission, the licensing will go through the town and then the state. If the town ups in but does not create that local commission, then it, the licensing would just take place at the state level. But if the town does not opt in, then it, no retail can come in. Okay. So there's two different things going there. Like what does the town opt in or not? And then if it does opt in, does it create the local control commission or not okay thanks for that 
I have quite a few questions or comments here, so please bear with me. Um, I have already punched it in my calendar to go to the HCC meeting to learn more yet about this. So uh, probably more will come through. I, I'll be curious to know, it would be, it'd be kind of good to know if we do it and if we don't, and if we don't, what happens then? So that's a question for future. Um, so it was mentioned, Kimberly, about the commission, and I'm just trying to think how that would work. We're, we're having a hard time filling our commissions as it is. We're, we've talked a minor amount about having a cemetery commission and we haven't gotten a, you know, we haven't done anything or decided on that yet, but, and, and then to have this as a, as another thing, our committee, we're, we're having trouble. I think it was mentioned earlier by somebody here that we can't even, we have committees. We don't have quorums, enough people for quorums. So I'm, I'm curious about that. It would be nice to know what our neighbors in Hampshire are doing with this, you know, if, if will this be available in Lebanon? Hanover, wherever, you know, what, what New Hampshire's up to with this? I, I have no idea. So that's a question for future as well. And so if we, if I'm just trying to figure this all in my head, say, say if we opt in tomorrow and we are, we're doing this, what, what we, how we would as a town handle that. And so I would assume that this would go through some sort of thing like a liquor license is now. So that would be more for our town clerk's office. And, and likewise with the police, because they, they have to weigh in on all our liquor license applications. So um, this would be a, a big thing. I, I shouldn't say burden, but extra duty for our town workers. I would have to imagine it's taking on a whole new thing. We've got a, a commission possibly, and we've got duties for extra duties, I think, for the town clerk's office and certainly the police, just in administering the licenses, let alone any fallout from having more, possible more uh, cannabis use. And uh, I also got confused on zoning, Kimberly. So on one hand, on, I thought somewhere in the early part of the presentation, it was mentioned that you can't do zoning to, to not have this. But then I then I thought I in a later present or later slide said you can have zoning to limit like around schools and such. Right. So um, the the idea of not using zoning to effectively prohibit it that that's coming from um, say a town holds the vote and enough people vote that they are opted in. Uh, the town decided to to opt in through the vote then. Uh, they would not be able to, at the town level, set up enough zoning regulations to where, even though the town voted yes, it prohibited an establishment from being able to locate. So they're basically saying you can't use zoning as a way to prohibit these establishments from operating in town if the town voted to allow them to operate in town. But you still can use zoning in other ways, so if you wanted to set like density limits, for example, that is something the town could explore. Um, and then things like buffer zones to keep these kind of establishments a certain distance from things like daycares, churches, schools. Thank you again for that. And, and just finally, I, I think it would be great to have a, a more of a definition on what cannabis actually means as far as, is this for medical use only? Is it, what what exactly is opting in doing? And I, and I don't know the answer to this. So I'm, like I said at last night's meeting about the RV thing is, I need to learn a lot more about this. I, I don't, I, I know next to nothing. <laughs> so uh, that's standard anyways for me. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I would really like to know what cannabis, exactly means that we may be opting into or not opting in out of or whatever. So that would be a big help for me, maybe others. 
Yeah, so the town would be opting into the sale of adult use uh, or recreational cannabis. So it is not the same thing as the medical. Um, you wouldn't need a med card to go purchase this. You would just need to be 21 or over. So it's just adult use recreational cannabis sales. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Uh, go Joe and the mic and Kim. Um, if I, I don't speak for any of the board, I would not feel comfortable with us making that decision. I would want the, the, the people of Hartford to make that decision. Uh, Tracy, uh, uh, what is our, what is the deadline for uh, getting this on the ballot? We have tentatively penciled in finalizing the warning on January 11th. Uh, that gives us a week if we see an issue with it or we don't agree or we don't come to a conclusion as a body um, to hold a special meeting and finalize it. But we basically 18th, 19th, that week right after Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, uh, we, we need to have that ready to go to the printers. The My second question is, say, someone does not get uh, enough signatures to put it on the ballot or we don't decide to put it on the ballot, can someone uh, at a later date get enough signatures and hold a special election and us spend six figures or five figures to, uh, to uh, a special election on this? The residents are welcome and able to at any time bring together a petition with about 5% of the registered voters. Um, and it goes through a whole internal process that I know a very high level about with the clerk. Um, and we would be required to hold a special election. So, or not special election, but yeah, a special mm -hmm. election. So yes, at any time um, that could happen. And you are correct. Uh, it's about five to $6,000 for us to hold one of those off cycle. Awesome. That was sarcasm, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. I, Chair. I bet you our town clerk heard it all the way at home because we know how much she likes <laughs> yeah, things I'm sure, I'm sure she was thrilled too. <laughs> so, Mike. Thanks, Dan. Um, so Kimberly, just follow up, right? So the select, it's, you can get 5% of the the voters in town can essentially petition for an election, but the select board, we could at any time, it doesn't have to match up necessarily with the town meeting um, ballot, although it would incur other costs, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, and just a couple notes, um, talking about commissions, not being able to fill them. I think the idea is the select board acts as like it does in the local liquor control board. We get you know, we approve whether someone gets a license or not. If we don't form that, then it sounds like the state would do it. So I don't know if it's a problem of personnel um, because, you know, we do that the same way with, with liquor licenses. Uh, the other comment is just extra work, police, town clerk and stuff. You can buy beer at every gas station in town. There are a lot of licenses. I think the way this will end up looking across the state is like towns that have liquor stores, like your town has one liquor store, other towns don't, right? It's not like every gas station in town is going to be selling cannabis. So I don't know that extra work for the town or the police is like, a, I, don't, I don't know, we'll have to see, but it doesn't strike me as being a huge concern right off the, the bat. So thank you. Kim, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I, I was having similar thoughts to what Dennis was expressing about just the sheer bandwidth of uh, of town staff and, and community committees, et cetera. Um, because I do think that part of the, um, the work group that Kimberly mentioned from Woodstock was not, I mean, that was a separate committee to sort of mm -hmm. lay some groundwork. Um, and which is why I asked the question, if we, don't put this on the March 2022 ballot. Can we put it on a later ballot? And you know, I'm both a fan of being a pioneer, but also not reinventing the wheel. And I, I definitely think that because this is so new, um, and we haven't, as far as I know, haven't really been approached by groups really wanting this to happen. Um, have you, okay, well, personally, I don't know of uh, any that I can recall. Maybe it was a while ago, but um, uh, and um, I had another thought to it. So I guess you know the if there is if there is a, a sense of desire for this from the community at large, I would love to hear more about it because um, 
I'm not opposed. I don't have a real strong opinion one way or another. We, you know, we don't have a choice but to let the voters choose. I'd rather have us just decide on a board as a board if we're going to put it on a regularly scheduled meeting ballot than to do a special election, certainly. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there are community members out there that if we don't decide to put it on the March ballot that would be inclined to do that, I'd like to know about it sooner rather than later. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts. It's just the, the, the bandwidth of the capacity. There's a lot of things that we still want to do that we haven't yet accomplished um, that we're waiting for resources and time and staff for. So that's just I just wanted to follow up on I had similar thoughts but I didn't want to keep Kimberly for that. So Kim I think you brought up a couple of good points and somewhere down here I was dancer landing but we did reach out to um people on the New Hampshire side for this forum on the 16th um so hopefully 13th, 13th sorry thank you um so hopefully we have someone just to know what they're doing because it's just a mile across you know mile down the road um and I if I remember correctly Kim I think last year we had two people that came to us sometime in the January March frame saying that they supported and wanted to wanted to follow up and find out the details and I think last year we said we don't have enough information we're going to wait till this year to sort of see what's what the legislature has done so so I know that at least two people have come to us previously in this forum and I don't like what no like like you said, what we want to prevent so that, as we know, more people come to regular elections and special elections, um, that we really don't want to have that cost incurred to the residents. So if there's a, um, if people really feel like they want this to let us know and or collect the signature so that this can happen at a regularly scheduled election, so we don't have to have all that extra work involved is, is the best way forward, I think. I mean, any yeah. options possible, but but if, if, if people have that desire of making that happen that way, would make things more smoothly, run more smoothly. So, Dennis. Thank you again. Yeah, uh, I know that we've had at least one citizen that suggested this, and I, I was already thinking along these lines. I think it would be good as we move forward with uh, working on this some more, whether yay or nay, uh, to hear from stakeholders like the police and whoever else might be involved or have a, you know, an opinion on this. You know, um, yeah, I just I hope that we could as a board hear more of uh, from stakeholder advice and opinions and so forth and that Thanks, would help me anyways okay. thank you Man. yeah i want to follow up on something that mike had said um yes we do have uh, a local option tax within the town of harford um and that will be levied in any sales that take place if we have a that won't be levied this no, no, not, we're not. It's just for alcohol, rooms, and meals. There's not a, a one percent surcharge on any sales. So, so we, so we don't still, get revenue from the sale of cannabis. So, even if we did levy it, if we could levy it against these sales, we would get one percent. But we still have to remember, though, that it's up to the voters on that local option tax to decide how that money is used. So, it's a well. I thought that was just for special instances. No, no, yeah. for everything. That's everything. Yeah. Everything the local adoption. So, so my biggest concern is that everyone talks about cannabis uh, regulated cannabis sales in their town to boost their revenue from the sales. And I'm not saying that it won't help perhaps other businesses within the town maybe coming in to buy cannabis. But where is that tax coming from that we're supposed to get such a shot in the arm from? Where is that money that the actual town's going to gain that much from? Because I see that if we do do this, we might have to look at increasing, you know, police presence and <laughs> increases we may have to increase. I'm not saying we're going to definitely do that, but um, I just want to know there, there's been this golden thing thrown out there that you're going to get more money. You should have it. The town, the town will get more money. I haven't seen anything that says how we're going to get more money from the sale, you know? I would just add, right now we can't get more money from the sale even if we started it up, you know, so I don't think anyone's promising this huge amount of revenue, it's all going to go to the state unless we can get any amount of it. And a 1% local sales tax, yeah, like it may, I, it may have to be approved by the voters for certain uses, but it is still additional money that can be spent in various ways pending voter approval. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there was a cannabis store right over across, right across the street right now and you went and bought some, we, the town would not get any revenue. So I don't think anyone's promising revenue at state level, perhaps, um, but certainly not at the town level, at least the way that the bills current with the act is currently written. Um, so. Thanks, go ahead. I, I want to say one thing before though, you dance. I, 
Um, I think I think a lot of this, um, all these questions, is is why we're having the forum. So um, you know, we've tried to include these people, try to include something from the police, the state legislature, other towns that may or may not have it on both sides of the river, so that those people are up there as a panel, and we as a town, we as a board, can gather a lot of information. So I, I don't, I think a lot of us are have a lot of questions, and hopefully after that presentation, all of us will know a lot more about what the benefits are, what the financially or not, how we can spend it on those things. So that's that's the intent. Thank you again. Uh, I'm I'm actually relieved at this point because I had wondered about the lot, you know, if it would apply to, you know, would get lot money from that. I'm actually glad that it's not because I, from for me speaking for me, I don't want this to be a financial decision whether we would have made a boatload of money on this. It's almost better for me at this point because there's unless the state is refunding us through the tax somehow. Uh, no financial benefit to us, many even cost us. So uh, that's what we need to know. But I don't want to base my decision on whether we we're going to make a boatload of money off of this or, or not. So. Thanks, Dan. Marcy Bartlett from Wilder. Um, the matter of cannabis is something that's given my family a lot of food for thought. Um, I emailed the board, Tracy, Emily Zanleone had posted something in today's listserv. That's why I'm here. When Tracy came a year ago, Tracy, yeah? Nine months. Nine months. <laughs> I, poor woman, got my sort of epistle about my opinion about this. I'm really glad that we're having this kind of a conversation um, and that it's measured, deliberate, informative. And I'd like to offer a perspective if I could of information that's scientific, measured, deliberate, informative. Those things I forwarded to the board, to Tracy and to Emily earlier today. When I saw this on the listserv, I reached out to my nephew, who's a sergeant in the Hanover PD, and asked him, can you send me some links about medical marijuana, et cetera? We're gonna be talking about this. Sent me this long list of stuff, which I've forwarded to you. And when I forwarded that to Emily, this is what I said. In response to, to all, and to all of you, in response to Emily's post in the morning's Hartford listserv, I reached out to my nephew, Sergeant in the Hanover PD, asking him to recommend reading material for our town as we seek to learn about whether we should have a dispensary in Hartford or not. I recall an earlier conversation he and I had, my understanding being that the benefits of medical marijuana can be given in an oral form, bypassing the much riskier smoked version. So this has to do with medical marijuana. I want to be clear, if we truly believe that science should lead us, we can follow it without being colored by our pet perspective or public pressure from special interest groups. For me personally, to even consider wiggle room concerning medical marijuana is a big concession to the conversation. Some of you who've been on the board for a while remember how passionate I am that we not have a dispensary in Hartford and my reasons personally. I'll try to attend this evening and hope that our H, uh, the police department is represented also. So I stopped by the PD today. It's the last day of November. And uh, there was a November in 2004 when our daughter was missing for a week, got kidnapped all around the whole matter of drugs and his mother as a grandmother, love is a higher law than any law we can make in town when you love your kids. The mama bear thing becomes paramount. And if you can't protect your kids, this conversation, frankly, becomes quite moot to me. She was forever changed. 
our family has become the walking wounded over this matter. And I know dozens of families in the state of Vermont who are worse off than I am, at least our daughter's alive. So we can talk about laws, we can talk about benefits. God forbid you make it on the basis of finances and making money off the backs of our kids. Um, you're not gonna hear from a lot of parents like me when you've lost the thing that's most precious to you. It doesn't cost me a thing to stand up here and look vulnerable, but there are plenty of parents who are still under the rock they've crawled under and won't have the nerve to be this kind of open. I really love you guys. The work you do is so precious for our town, but there's a lot of people who won't do what I'm doing here. So November's a tough month. Going and finding Captain Rich sobbing in his arms when they found our kid. We've never really found her though. We don't have her anymore. That's all. I did print out a few things. Drug fact sheet, met marijuana, cannabis. It's in the back if you want. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah. Um, can we get Allie? Yeah, Allie, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm just going to keep my video off because my internet connection is a little spotty, but um, also thank you, Marcy, for sharing that and and for your vulnerability, that's really appreciated. Um, I just have, I think, a general question back to Kimberly. And again, my internet was a little bit spotty, so apologies if this question was already asked. But I think earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned that we should be expecting some recommendations from the Cannabis Control Board at the state level somewhat soon. And I mean, I think I'm in a similar boat to as other board members and just you know, wanting um, as much information as possible and any guidance um, at the state level would be, you know, extremely helpful. So I'm not sure if you have any understanding of when we might expect any of those recommendations from the state level's Cannabis Control Board. Um, so I know they are still continuing to meet. They're, they're doing like two meetings a week. They're still booked up for this week. Um, not positive when they'll be complete with all of their recommendations. I'm trying to look on their website now. Um, they do keep their site pretty up to date. Okay, yeah, no worries. If, if it's something that I can easily, um, you know, use the Google and find it, I'll absolutely look for that and, and see what information they have. But um, yeah, I was just curious because um, that information would just be extremely helpful. And I, you know, similarly, am looking forward to the town hall on the 13th. I think that'll be extremely informative. Thanks. Mm -hmm. this, the Cannabis Control Board does also have a way for you to um, sign up because the meetings often are, um, the agenda is announced like just a few days before, but if you sign up to their email list, they um, send that out so you can get the info about their meetings as, as soon as that's set. Great, thank you. Thanks, Allie. Thanks, Kimberly. Can you bring Kathy over? Can you bring Kathy over? Hi again, this is um, Kathy Melisic, Wilder, Vermont. Um, and I want to start by saying I also appreciate my beloved neighbor, Marcy's comments and Allie's comments about that, too. Um, I, um, I tend to lean more toward the, you know, the freedom for adult decision makers when it comes to cannabis and um, as with alcohol and other things. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Kimberly. And I want I, is it possible for us generic members of the public to also get a copy of your slide deck if we email you? Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Okay, because it was wonderful. And I it went by so fast. I want to ask you a million questions, but I'll read the slide deck first. Um, and I am, um, did you say on there that, did it say on the slide deck somewhere that it's better to wait 
for something to come up before we vote on a commission or things like that? I, I wasn't sure I read that right. Yeah, in some discussions we were having um, just the thought of um, waiting until all of those regulations are set by uh -huh. the state to, to hold a vote or not. Like, I feel like some, some towns, you know, feel like they need to get it on the ballot for this March. Um, and that's totally up to the town, but it would also make sense to have all those finalized regulations from the state level okay. prior to, to holding a vote. So yeah, of course it's just up to whatever the towns end up wanting to do, but um, yeah, just a recommendation we we're kind of making in this general list of recommendations would be to um, maybe try to wait to hold a vote until everything is set at the state level. Okay, do we know, I mean, is there any guess as to when, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> when those might be? I'm sorry, that's a horrible question to have to ask someone when the state's gonna decide on something. <laughs> I, I know they still, so they still have meetings upcoming um, and then things will have to go into a um, period where they're open for review and public comment. Okay. And so I think last I'd heard they were still thinking a, a couple months out. Um, okay. The yeah. reason I'm asking is um, knowing of friends who have worked for, um, you know, retail cannabis sales in their towns in Massachusetts, there some towns got to jump on this to vote, you know, to bring something on the ballot that says we will not allow it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was concerned about does waiting make the likelihood of that more possible, which I would disagree with. So, um, but I'll follow up with you separately on that. Once I get the deck and can read more into it. Um, with regard to what Mr. Brown said, um, I, and, and with due, all due respect, while it's nice to say that the police are the stakeholders and there's other stakeholders, um, I feel like we, the taxpayers and the residents are the stakeholders on this. And we would make the decisions with regard to what our commission says, what we vote to do on all that. And obviously we want to know how this would affect departments like the police, how it would affect, you know, traffic, how it would affect, you know, I, I would love to see this added as something on our local option tax, um, along with alcohol and, um, I forgot what the other thing was. Um, but I, you know, I, I feel strongly that we're the stakeholders in this. And I personally, while well, it's nice you invited New Hampshire people, I personally don't care what New Hampshire says on this. <laughs> you know, it's like people say that Connecticut River is sometimes like the Berlin Wall between us. Um, the other question I had was, is it true that, um, so, so right now we don't know how the state is going to distribute the tax monies on this, like whether it goes into the general fund, how it's going to distribute monies to towns. I mean, we could do all this work as a town and not see money except for that thing people always say about, well, but people will visit your restaurants, people will use your gas stations, you know, that kind of tangential stuff. Do we know where the state's planning to put these monies if we have a retail cannabis dispensary? Yes, and I'm trying to find in my notes where, what that percentage split was. Um, some is directed to like, um, prevention programming. Um, I might need to follow back with you. Okay, so I, I can follow up with you on it. I, I was curious about that um, because you know if we're doing the heavy lifting, and I'm all for like regulated, sensible, adult choice dispensaries in town. Um, I would, if we're doing the heavy lifting as a town for this, I would want to know like what do we actually get for it, you know? Right. And as of right now, um, all that's been recommended by the Cannabis Control Board at the state level is um, a licensing application fee. And so that would go to the town, but I think they have recommended that that be capped at $100. Oh no, that's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was super informative and I really appreciate your coming to talk with us about this. Thank you. And I'm done. Thanks, Kathy. Can anyone else? I do not think so. Oh, yeah, Mike Morris. Good evening, everybody. Mike Morris, Hartford, Vermont. Um, uh, many years ago, I was a complete opponent of any cannabis sales done legally. Um, but 
as many of you know, just a few years back, uh, our daughter going through a bout with cancer. Um, she was a registered nurse, ate healthy, vegan at one point, didn't abuse alcohol, didn't abuse drugs. But like I said, registered nurse works on her master's uh, came down with stage four cancer. And cannabis was a major factor in some of her comfort of taking chemotherapy and other treatments. And I also feel that, not just for medicinal reasons, but I think it'd be less expensive for all the taxpayers in the long run to legalize and uh, allow the sale of it than to try to enforce and penalize for the usage of it, especially when we have alcohol probably being the number one drug in the world causing more problems than anything else. So I, I, I support the town having, a, having the sales of it. We want to welcome business in our town. This is another business. I think we need to welcome it. Uh, it's legal now and it's going to stay legal, I feel. So let's work with it, not against it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That's it. That's it. Okay. All right, Dennis. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, to, to Ms. Ms. Melisek, uh, I wish I had broadened my statement about stakeholders. I, you're right. We're all in this together for this. So um, I was thinking of major stakeholders probably, but uh, certainly we want to hear from the citizens to one this. And so we're all in it together. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, let's go to um, the Hartford Cemetery update. Do you want to go, Ken? No. Ken's here to, okay. to let you know. Right. These are okay. these are the Hartford Cemetery update expert. You a bear or a bear? Bear's fine, or if you want to sit down. Good evening. My name is Ken Parker. I'm from Ken, can you just make sure the microphone is, I can't tell from this angle. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Ken Parker. I'm from Hartford. I live in Hartford Village. And uh, Tracy asked me to uh, come and speak with you this evening, uh, give you an update on cemeteries. And I'm here to answer questions you might have. I would tell you that I think our cemeteries are in pretty good shape. Uh, we've uh, had a community that's been generous and I think hearkened to uh, the, the notion that uh, how a community takes care of its cemeteries really speaks about what the community does for itself, and what it thinks of itself. And I think that's been very much the case. Uh, we've had uh, uh, an increase in our uh, appropriations from the board and the public over the last three years. And I think uh, that's been a fruitful uh, investment that's been made by the community uh, to uh, give us the uh, opportunity to better maintain and do some things in our cemeteries that we weren't able to do when we were dependent upon uh, the return on any endowment uh, investments that we had. Uh, as you can well appreciate, I think, from your own experience, uh, the uh, interest that's earned by uh, investments today is minimal at best. And we found ourselves in a situation where I think about four years ago, we had a cemetery study committee, and uh, that uh, committee did uh, uh, extensive work in looking at some of the shortfalls uh, that uh, the lack of uh, funding was uh, imposing on us in terms of what we could do in the five cemeteries in the community. Uh, just so that I know I've spoken to most of you on the board, but there are a couple of new members and I just want to acquaint you with the fact that uh, uh, four of our cemeteries, that is the Hartford Cemetery, which is the largest, it's on Maple Street. That's the one that I'm responsible for. 
the uh, Christian Street Cemetery, which was uh, a, 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 an association, but I believe it's now owned by the town. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kuichi uh, Cemetery Association in Kuichi and the West Hartford Cemetery Association in West Hartford were all independent uh, nonprofit entities that uh, were in part funded by the town. In addition to uh, those four is uh, Mount Olivet and St. Anthony's uh, Cemetery, which is on South Main Street. It's still an active cemetery, but uh, there's not much activity there. Uh, the uh, Mount Olivet is owned by the Diocese of Burlington, and we do fund uh, some of their maintenance work as well. Um, we have, when I say we, the cemetery study committee, we have made some recommendations and I was pleased to hear Mr. Brown mention the fact that there is some consideration being given to a cemetery commission. Uh, we felt at the time we did the study, and I think that's still a fairly prevalent feeling that uh, the town really ought to have a cemetery commission. Uh, it ought to be able to coordinate the activities that are going on in the cemeteries uh, from one central uh, entity. Now, there are some cemeteries that at the present time probably wouldn't want to participate if they didn't have to, but let's, let's face the facts. There, there's never enough money to do what needs to be done in the cemeteries. So at some point, there's going to be a breaking point. And you found that to be the case with Christian Street. Uh, they got to a point where they just could not sustain their operation. Uh, the sexton who was filling uh, the role uh, after uh, a gentleman retired following many years of service, uh, that uh, individual said, I, I can't do this. And there are others of us who are getting a little long in the tooth and it's becoming a challenge to, uh, to do the work that's necessary to manage the cemeteries in town. So I, I think at least initiating the discussion and moving forward with that particular notion makes a lot of sense. It does, I believe, require a change to our town charter if you're gonna do that. And if that's the case, the change of a charter has to go to the legislature. And that's probably a two, maybe even a three year period of time to get that accomplished. Uh, it's going to have to be voted on by the, the uh, community as well. So that uh, I think you're probably looking at three to five years before you could actually have a functioning cemetery as provided for by the statutes in Vermont. Uh, so I guess uh, if I leave you with one thing in that regard, uh, it's time to get on the horse. Uh, it's been time to get on the horse for quite a while, but uh, uh, I, I don't think it's beneficial for us looking out into the future to postpone or delay making the decision whether or not to do that. And if you're not going to do it, then let's know about it. And I think you then need to plan accordingly because I would expect that two to five years down the road, you're going to have cemeteries uh, that you're going to be looking at taking over. Uh, the uh, other thing that the cemetery commission proposed, and this may be chatter for some of you uh, uh, that you haven't heard before, but uh, we need a central place to store the historical documents of cemeteries that's environmentally controlled. Uh, it's a central, got to be a central place where people that want to do genealogy studies and uh, trace down their ancestors can go and, and look at either the records or a facsimile of the records. We don't have that in town now. Uh, and it's unfortunate because I know there are cemetery records that are very, very fragile and they really need to be protected. And they can't be protected in somebody's garage or in somebody's spare bedroom. Uh, so, I'm serious. I've preached this before. Some of you think, oh, here he comes again with this repetition of a, 
of a plea, but it really needs to be done because the history of our community is in part represented by uh, our ancestors and uh, we need to preserve as much as we can of that sort of thing. The Hartford Cemetery is in uh, uh, reasonably good shape. Uh, the community has been generous to us and uh, I've put in a, 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 a request for funding that's the same as we received last year. Some of you want to know where the money's going and I'm going to try to give you a thumbnail sketch of that. Right now, I have made it known any time that I've appeared before the board that we need to do some significant road repair work in, in the cemetery. That takes a fair amount of money. And over the past three years, I've been setting aside a portion of the appropriation so that we would have a sum of money that we could do the bulk of the work in the cemetery. Uh, I think we're at a point where we're probably uh, at least at a minimum in terms of what we would spend uh, to do the road replacement that's in the middle level of, of the Hartford Cemetery. I had quotes from a couple of contractors this summer uh, that were in the 70 to $75,000 price range. I have about that much money set aside in our account. The additional money that has been appropriated to us over the years has paid for mowing, trimming, monument repair, uh, other tree work, for instance, last year, we spent $24,000 roughly taking down trees uh, that were a danger to the public. Uh, it needed to be uh, removed before they fell on somebody. And uh, that work was done by a local tree uh, company. Uh, we still have some more to do. So I think part of what our appropriation this year that we're looking for will take care of some of the next phase of, of tree work and that sort of thing in the cemetery. Our appropriation uh, last year was, I think, $75,500. So, Tracy, help me here. <laughs> Ooh, I'm not going to have that one on the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Trust me, that was it was somewhere in that vicinity. So we've put roughly $25,000 a year aside uh, for the, the eventual road repair that's in the, the, in the cemetery. Uh, that should not come as news to anybody that's been on the table uh, each year going forward. Um, you can't drive a vehicle around the center level of the cemetery now without bottoming out much of the way around it. And we're not talking about building an interstate highway through there. We're talking about uh, digging down the existing pavement uh, and, and the uh, base to the pavement uh, about a foot, putting gravel in and putting a, a layer of crushed uh, crusher run stone around the, uh, the, the loop in the middle part of the cemetery. Uh, any questions? Thanks, Greg. I'll, I'll and tell you the, the last sentence you said, I didn't have any questions because you answered them all. Uh, is that to say that they're not gonna pave the middle section again, just cross stone? Doesn't, doesn't make sense to pave it, Dennis. It, no, it, no other cemetery given given, given the cost of pave it, uh, with yeah. paving now, it would double the amount that I've just spoken about. It makes total sense. It's Benefit. about 1,700 feet around that loop. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome. I, can I just say that, I, you know, I'm talking about the Hartford Cemetery, but each cemetery in town needs to have the continued support of this board and the community. I mean, we, we all benefit when the funding rose, we all were at a point where we could start to do some things that we hadn't been able to do for lack of money. And uh, uh, I think it's important that we continue. Thanks. Um, I guess 
big part of getting on the horse is the charter commission. Have we, have we gotten any other applications for the charter? Commission? You do have some other applications that have come in in the past few days, but I haven't had a chance to mm -hmm. circle around about them. Okay, that's um, So that is something that we can uh, probably bring forth after the holiday because we're, we're ticking down these last few meetings before yeah. we break for the holidays for a few weeks. Totally, but that could definitely be a big priority for 2022, I would think. I mean, it's been. Oh, oh, but I was gonna say, I mean, it's really kind of chair to chair because there is yeah. that school board component. So I, I just kind of collect the paperwork with Lana and, and just circle around the edges on that one. The charter is school and town. Yeah. So we have we now have four applicants, which I have, and have reached out to the school board several times. But they're extremely busy sure. with everything going on with course. COVID. So yeah. Um. So it's kind of, just kind yeah. of waiting for them to come up for air and be able to get back to us. And I don't know. Um, if they have anyone that's applied to them yet. And there's one person that we jointly appoint. So so we now have four, we appoint two, and then one jointly with the school board we appoint. Um, and folks can still apply, right? It's not if we did another push by we, I mean, any of us individually or the- I don't, I, I don't know, Lana, do you have the, the deadlines on that? Or do we know where we are with that? We're I'm kind not, of I'm open. Sure. I mean, you yeah, can, it's open. It's yeah. open. So, um, you know, so you I think yes, email yes. it, drop it off. Yeah. Um, we just keep putting them in a little file folder and waiting for the next step to happen. Okay. And if we have four and the school board has none, we might plead with those people to apply on the school board's behalf. Yeah. Just so we have, you know, so we can move this forward, as you said. Okay. okay. Yeah. May, I, may I say something? Excuse me. A, a, a lifetime ago, uh, I was a member of the legislature, and I served on the municipal corporations committee, which was the committee that dealt with. Um, charters and things. I don't think we've ever really impressed upon people in our community how important the charter is, what the benefits are, how much we benefit as a community by having a charter where we can specifically design proportions of our government uh, in a much more refined way than the state statutes enable us to do. Uh, this is a, uh, our charter is a law that was passed specifically for the town of Hartford. Any town that has a charter, it, it's a specific law for them. But I think it, it, part, of, part of the responsibility of the board and of uh, citizens is to have a discussion about what the importance and what the benefits of a charter are. It slips by the wayside, and I don't think we look at it uh, seriously enough. It's things like the, the, the uh, local option tax, which needed to go through a, a process with the legislature. Um, the, the cemetery commission, how we define a town manager's responsibilities and other things are all wrapped up in Hartford's charter. So I think if nothing else, you know, let's talk about it more as a community. I think maybe you can get community spirit and com uh, community members to raise their hand and say, sure, I'll do that and not look at it as a political process as much as it is a governance process. Can I send you an application, Ken? Sure. <laughs> For the Charter Commission? Oh, can you sign me up? No, I've been down that route, thank you. <laughs> it's worth uh, a try. I'm, I'm, sure. I'm trying to pull my horns back in, uh, uh, Kim. Good idea. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Lynn, do you want to say something? Oh, uh, no, I, no I, I'll let it wait till. Okay. Right. Anyone else? Comments from the public? Any questions? <coughs> Anyone online can? No hands up. Allie, are you, do you have anything, Allie, that you want to add? I'm all set. Thank you. All right. Great. Okay. Ken, thank you so much. Thanks for coming in and updating us and keeping it in Thanks. the forefront. So it's always a pleasure to speak to the, the that one. Always a pleasure to speak to the board from this side of the desk. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. So let's, um, we're a little behind schedule, but not too, too bad. So let's go with the certified local government historic preservation grant planning, and then we'll take a short break. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm here with uh, Chair of the uh, Historic Preservation Commission, Jonathan Sheckman. I'm from Quiche, and we're here because this is the annual uh, Vermont Certified Local Government Grant Program. Um, we're soliciting support 
from the select board to help us uh, match and leverage uh, a grant. So Hartford is one of 17 CLGs in Vermont. It's funded through the Federal National Park Service Historic Preservation Fund, which requires compliance with federal rules and regulations. Hartford has greatly benefited from the CLG program. And since begin, beginning becoming sorry, a CLG in 1993, Hartford has used local dollars and in-kind time to leverage $188,487 in CLG funding. Uh, the CLG grants have allowed the, his, the Hartford Historic Preservation Commission to take on many projects. Uh, that includes nine historic district, national uh, historic district nominations, two historic district updates, historic district brochures, Taft's flat intensive level survey, two historic sites and structures surveys, a barn census, and something that Ken would appreciate uh, that Dennis assisted us with is the cemetery research and oral history, uh, which mapped the uh, various cemeteries, private and public, uh, known and unknown. Uh, we also had four other demolition, uh, sorry, four other oral history projects and we uh, have a demolition uh, delay standards for historic buildings. Hartford has a, uh, do you want me to go on to that or? I can. I can sure, thank you. So Hartford has a rich history of performing arts. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission is seeking ways to document that history. So there's a, darth, a, a lack of information. Um, so the purpose of the grant is to hire a consultant uh, to co conduct research on performing arts history and its connection to historic buildings, um, some that exist today and some that no longer exist. And, it's con and it develop a written report, conduct oral history interviews uh, with residents who have experienced um, attending performing arts in years past. Um, we plan on holding two community meetings to solicit community input and share the findings from the research and the interviews. The total cost of the project will be $18,308. Uh, the cost to hire a consultant would be $13,000. Um, the CLG grant program requires a, a, a minimum 40% local match, and that can be comprised of cash, staff, and kind time, as well as um, Historic Preservation Commission volunteer time. Um, the value of in-kind staff time is um, estimated at $3,500 and the donated time of the Historic Preservation Commission members would be $1,500. And um, we also propose spending $300 on advertisements. Um, the CLG grant would be uh, $9,121. Um, we're proposing to do a local match of $9,187, so slightly over 50%. Um, to provide a larger match gives us a little bit more um, scoring to become more competitive in the grant application. Um, so the, the total budget would be $18,308. Uh, the funds are available in the current fiscal year budget. And this is the same project that we came before you um, to get your approval a year ago and we were not funded. Um, we feel like we can provide a lot more detailed information and have a competitive, um, more competitive grant application this time around. So I have questions? Hey. So do I understand correctly, Matt, that it was applied for, but didn't receive it, correct? That's correct. That was last year. It was a very, it was the most competitive um, grant round of the CLG grant program since it was established. And is that the first time you'd been denied the grant? And that was the first time we've been denied the grant. Thank you. Can yeah, I just you. add to that? So just so you know, there's a, I think I got this right. There's a, a certain pool of money. Not everybody gets it. So some get denied, some get approved. And that time we didn't, but that's, that's part of why we, it was, they gave the money away, but we didn't qualify for it that time. Um, just one quick question um, from previous grants to make sure that the staff that's involved with donating their time is aware that they're going to be responsible for that. We're not, this is not going to show up on someone's plate unannounced. No, okay. I mean, okay. we, we factor that in. <laughs> okay. 
And it's not, it, the total amount of staff time hours is 65 hours total over the course of, you know, a more than a year long project. Okay. Um, Tracy, this is a question for you. Where would this come out of the budget at? What, what department or what? Uh, so I, I, I guess I can answer that. Um, so um, there's $2,200 under the um, current um, line item 10625316. Um, that's the annual appropriation to the Historic Preservation Commission for the grant pro project. Um, and there was $1,560 that were encumbered um, from the last fiscal year. Um, and $300 that would be used in the advertising budget of the Historic Preservation Commission. So the, the total um, cash amount of $4,179 is within the Historic Preservation Commission's budget. Okay, thank you. Yes. Comment, and then I'd like to move this if nobody else has questions. So uh, along with what was just asked, so we're we're competing with is it seventeen other towns that are sixteen CLG? others there are a total of seventeen okay so that that's we're, they're all trying to get this money too when we just didn't get that so with that I'd like to move that we approve the submission of a grant application for the twenty twenty two certified local government program and authorize the town manager to sign all documents related to the grant application and project implementation I second that. Any further discussion or comments? None we'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Alice. So it's unanimous. Great. Thank aye. you. All right. Thank so you. it's thank you guys. Thank you for presenting. Thank Thanks for the information, the updates on that. Um, so it's eight o'clock, so we'll take a short break. Uh, let's shoot for being back at five after. We'll go as long as 10 after if we need to. Thank you.
Just make sure Allie's ready to go. I'm here. Thanks, Allie. Um, and Hannah, so when you're ready, thanks for joining us. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for so, so much for having me. Uh, my name is Hannah Tyler, and I'm the Director of Public Works. <clears throat> so since the next two items that we're here for are solid waste, um, one of the messages that I really want to get across to everyone is that as we move forward in whatever manner we all decide is the right way to do it, um, that we are doing this in a manner that is in total partnership with um, the state for compliance. Um, we know we're going to rattle some trees here um, because we're shaking up a whole regional waste disposal system. Um, so, you know, we're working really closely with the state to ensure that we are in full compliance um, with all of the regulations that they require for our community. Um, so our first item tonight is asking the board to approve uh, our RFQ request for qualifications proposal that we issued uh, several weeks ago. Um, in hearing that we are looking to transition to a more sustainable way to manage solid waste for town of Hartford residents, we issued a request for qualifications to in, uh, nationally um, for any consultant to make proposals to us to review what we do now um, and help us with a transition to something that's more sustainable for us. <clears throat> Um, so a little bit of RFQ 101. Um, so a request for qualifications is a way for uh, municipalities and governments on both very local levels and all the way up to federal levels to evaluate consultants on a qualifications-based manner rather than bid proposals. So in an instance such as this, where we're taking something that's a really big bite and we wanna be able to work with the consultant that we feel is the most qualified, we ask for them to provide us with, you know, kind of a pretty thick proposal of, you know, past projects they've worked on, local experience. Um, so we ask for a lot of information from them to make a proposal to us. And we worked with uh, Tracy uh, Mark Morgan, who is the uh, Lebanon solid waste manager. Um, we worked with um, John Fay, who is the recycling coordinator for the Wyndham Southeast Solid Waste Management District, who formerly worked in the state's um, solid waste permitting. Um, department and myself to review the proposals that were received and evaluate them. Um, and so essentially what we're asking for this evening is for all of you to approve the ratings in similar manners as we have done before with um, some of our uh, state revolving loan funds um, so that we can continue to use this uh, <laughs> this proposal, sorry, I'm having a little moment. Um, we want to be able to continue to use this manner of soliciting proposals <laughs> to meet the needs of our procurement policy, um, but also utilize a firm who the four of us all, all believe is a fully certified firm to meet the needs of this proposal. Um, the ratings for multiple different um, avenues of evaluating our solid waste facility and regulatory needs are in the packet. Um, Sanborn Head, who does have a local office to Vermont, um, really shined above everybody, uh, but there were several very qualified proposals. Um, so we're just asking that the board approve our rating system so we can continue to work with them as we transition. 
Thank you, Anna. Kim, go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you. Go, Joe. <laughs> um, what was the criteria that you came up with to, to rank Sanborn number one? Um, I don't have the proposal in front of me. We did issue an extensive uh, request for qualifications that rated all of the firms that were solicited um, in terms of solid waste management consulting, solid waste management engineering, and environmental, uh, environmental monitoring. Joe, some of the other things that we looked at is uh, responsiveness, completeness of their proposal, the background of the individuals that would be part of the team, um, previous and other projects that they're working on, if they matched uh, kind of what we thought Hartford needed in terms of that. Um, and then uh, also, uh, I believe we, we spoke with the top two. And so just, uh, I don't want to say a gut feeling, but how they presented to all of us, the, how they answered their questions. Um, and for me, a big component of this was how they interacted with community engagement. So that's where I was coming from, uh, not being a solid waste person myself. Where's Sanborn hit out of? Ooh, that's a Hannah question. They're, they have a local office, but they have other offices okay. as well. But they do have a local office. So they, that's correct. I don't remember exactly what town it is, so I don't want to misspeak. They are local to Vermont. And I do want to clarify that they are the firm who has spent quite a bit of time at our solid waste facility. Um, they were heavily involved in the design and permitting of the um, solar fields on the facility. Uh, they are also the firm who uh, took the most interest in assisting us with our methane investigation mitigation issue currently um, because they were familiar with the facility. Um, so they have... And I know they've worked with other local um, solid waste entities for a variety of reasons. Um, they came highly recommended. So both, they were. both you and Tracy obviously worked with them before and you have a sense of comfort with them. Yes. Yeah, they're knowledgeable about the area and I, I was um, impressed with um, their plans for community engagement, which can often be difficult um, to get a variety of people to the table, not just the same old folks. Thank you. you want to keep going? Yeah, I, just to clarify the, so the RFQ process opposed to the RFP process, is that anything like that, are we having any decision on, I mean, that, that part's already been done, I guess my, okay, sorry, let me form a question. <laughs> um, you said why you did an RFQ. So this is perfectly in line with our procurement policy. Yes? Yes. Great. Okay. Yes. Just at the end when you were- um, So this is a really- Nope, go ahead. You go, just at the end when you were speaking, somehow I was jarred to think that you were asking us to approve the RFQ process, but- that's already been done. So it's just approving this company through an RFQ process, right? So what we're actually asking tonight <laughs> is for the board essentially to have, uh, to trust in our ability to uh, vet an RFQ process in accordance with town of Hartford purchasing policy requirements. Um, so this is something that we do, I can't say regularly, but this is really something that is commonly accepted very nationally and statewide to vet people based on their qualifications, not as a low bidder status, um, because we want the right person for the job, not necessarily the lowest bidder, especially in a case like this. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
some of the same concerns that Joe had in terms of the criteria to do the evaluation scores. Um, it's very easy to skew data to lead in the direction that you want. And I'm not saying that's done here, but we don't have anything presented to us as far as what the data was that you used to come up with these scores. And, and that bothers me because this data that you've, you've come up with, you, you stated that the community engagement, well, what sort of community engagement is this done? Uh, I'd, I'd like to know what that is. I'd like to know what the actual uh, plan is for these folks that going ahead. I mean, you had to base these scores off of something uh, and I'd like to know what that was you based these scores off of. And, and I feel more comfortable giving the go ahead for this evaluation process if I had that information. Um, this is just, you're just giving me numbers without the data go behind that. And I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, so I'm gonna not support this without the data to back that up. So I understand that it can be um, uncomfortable for some people to approve of this type of, um, uh, I don't want to call it a bidding situation because that's not exactly what it is. Um, so what ultimately happens is that we issue a very clear uh, request for qualifications and uh, Chris Hallsworth, as our project manager, then issues um, all, all of the selected participants in the review committee um, a worksheet to work through how we evaluate their proposals. Ultimately, it is based on opinion, and we rely on people who are experts in the field and also varied opinions um, to review those proposals. So that's why, you know, we did review, we did rely on uh, Mark Morgan as the solid waste manager in the city of Lebanon. Um, we, re we relied on John Fay, who works for the Wyndham Solid Waste District, who also has a ton of experience as a permitting official for the state of Vermont, myself, um, and Tracy to provide scores, essentially. And, and that really is the way that um, requests for qualifications proposals are scored, um, you know, at both the local um, and regional and national level. Um, so we do understand that it could be a little bit you know, I, it is based on opinion and it's hard to pinpoint an exact data point, um, but it is the way that, you know, these are typically evaluated. Just a, a follow-up for that. I mean, if you sent these things out to these companies, I'd like to see that given to us. That's the problem I'm having with this is because I don't see anything that tells me what the evaluation was. And I, I don't wanna hear that we have to trust our experts again because we've heard that all the time. And I still wanna see from given to this board what the criteria was that we came up with these evaluation scores. I, I don't think that's too much to ask to present that data to us. Um, I'm, I'm still not supportive of this. Tracy, what right? That's, sorry. I just want to make sure I, I need to look at the procurement policy. There are lines of demarcation in the sand and to make sure that we do get you guys the appropriate information, but we don't necessarily step over the line on your role and, and other people's roles in the procurement policy. So that is something if you all move forward that I definitely want to double check um, and make sure that we are not um, moving into some gray area in terms of competitive contracting at the, at the town. Thank you. Thanks. Dennis, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you again, Mr. Chair. So I find this report interesting in, in several ways. And, and I mean, as you're working on this, you had to start somewhere. So I think that asking these questions, whatever they were and whatnot and evaluating this gives a good starting point. I mean, but but in the end, th this report, the, the scores are 
pretty close. There's, there's other than the first vendor that's listed uh, that didn't apply, I guess. I, I would look at this and say, that's a tough decision. That there's no bad choice because they're, they're, other than maybe a couple of scores, they're, they're pretty close. So nobody dropped, dropped off the back of the wagon with this thing. So uh, I, I'm interested in this and I, I do get nervous about statistics. Uh, to quote a Hartford resident, Paul Keene, there's, when it comes to statistics, he said that um, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. And I never forgot that. And uh, at the library where I used to work, we used to have a, a book, uh, How to Lie with Statistics. I'm not suggesting that's happened here, but it just gives me a, a I, I just, when I see numbers like this, I just wonder. But again, it's, it's, it's certainly a good starting point to narrow this down to people. And I, I've heard of Du Bois King. I know they've worked with us in the past. I don't, I'm not familiar with these other ones. I just, they, they may have, I just don't remember the names. So I, I think it's probably a, a good thing what you've done here to get the discussion started. And you've, you've relied on several different uh, folks to help weigh in with this thing. So I think it's, I think it's good. It's, it's not, like I said, the numbers are so close. It's, it'd be a tough decision when you look at this. I, I just wonder if you look at it and say there's no bad choice here, but yeah, I mean, I know it commented that uh, some shine more than others and so forth, but anyways, wait to hear more. Thank you. Thanks Dennis. Hannah, go ahead when you're ready. Sorry, Mike. It's all right. <laughs> oh, okay. So one of the things that I want to be really clear about is that by the board accepting what the ranking committee's reviews ultimately came out at, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're awarding one big contract to Sanborn Head. All that it means is that you understand that we have done a very standard procurement policy um, to receive requests for qualifications. And what this allows us to do <clears throat> is that when we start taking next steps, we can identify crystal clear tasks and issue that task order to at least the top three respondents here and then negotiate a price with them and evaluate that. So I just wanna make it very clear that we are not in any way awarding one gigantic contract to any one vendor that's listed here. It's allowing us to um, utilize these vendors to our best, um, in our best interest, both for qualifications and price now that we've already solicited their qualifications. And I'm the request for qualifications was publicly available. And so I'm happy to share that with, once again, with um, members of the public and the board so they can see, that, see the, all the research and work that we're doing to get to this place. Thanks, Anna. Mike? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Hannah. I think you just, answer the question I had. So it sounds like if we have project work, we would solicit like a request for a proposal from the three firms now that we've decided that they're qualified to do this kind of work. That's correct. Okay, gotcha. And I thank you. I know we have a lot of issues with the solid waste and I'm here, I know you're working with the clean, I'm reading off your memorandum here, so I don't have this knowledge in my head. So um, I'm just um, appreciating your expertise here about you know consulting with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, making sure that we comply with the state and federal regulations and that this is in the town's best interest and that many of the loans involve um, substantial loan forgiveness and subsidies. So I appreciate your work on that. And and um, I mean, I think you have some good questions, but I think, especially with this packet, which we had almost a week to review, I think those questions would be good to reach out to, like maybe in writing to email to Hannah so that we can have that information to refer to and anyone in the public also has that kind of ahead of time um, so that we can see that it's pretty black and white transparent for people. So I think that will that will clear a lot of things up um, ahead of time and hopefully answer some of those questions down the road. So any other discussion? 
Um, there is one. Oh, there's one hand up. Um, which they, can you can we try Brian again? It might yeah. be on a previous okay. topic. Yeah. Brian, can you unmute yourself? Are you there, Brian? He was. Okay. So we'll assume <laughs> maybe that was a previous topic. I'm not sure. Oh, all right. Okay. Brian, if it any. Are you there, Brian? <coughs> Ryan? You might just be hearing feedback because Anna's unmuted. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank you for trying. Okay. So, any other discussion? Okay. Then we'll entertain a motion. Kim, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chair, I move that the select board accept the RFQ evaluation ratings for solid waste consulting, engineering, and environmental monitoring services, which determined Sanborn Head to be the most qualified firm. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Mike, any other questions or comments? And go ahead. No, I'm going to vote no on this for the reasons that I've given, uh, just to everybody know and the public know that <coughs> I just like more information on the evaluation process. Okay, okay so all in favor, um, raise your hand, please, or so we can do this sort of by roll call. So in favor is Kim, Mike, Joe, Dennis. And Allie, what's your vote on this one? Got her hand oh, hand raised. Because Allie's in favor. Uh, any opposed? So Lanny opposed, and I'm in favor as well. So so one opposed and six in favor. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, next up is construction and demolition debris removal contract. So Hannah. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm back. <laughs> and just sorry to do a quick reversal. I actually talked to Tracy this afternoon, and we both thought it would be a really good idea. Um, at an upcoming board meeting uh, when we uh, maybe had a quiet agenda that we would do a kind of a, an RFQ 101. So everyone on the board and all of our community members kind of understood the difference between like asking for bids and seeking qualifications for contractors and how that fits into a lot of our funding sources, um, just like the actually the clean water revolving fund uh, that's um, issued by the state, they require that we do a request for qualifications. So I think it'd be really helpful for everybody to understand how we get there, uh, what information we ask for, how we choose people to be on the selection committee, and um, at the end of the day, what information is appropriate to share. So I kind of look forward to having an opportunity to discuss that with everyone. <laughs> so sorry if that wasn't quite germane, but I just wanted, wanted an opportunity to say that. Uh, so again, I'm just going to echo that our message tonight is a partnership with the state, which is our regulatory agency, um, to make sure that we're meeting all of our check boxes for solid waste disposal and also working with our community to understand um, what things work well for us and what things don't. Uh, so one of the things that's come out of our recent conversations with the state is that uh, we had two years to uh, dispose of some of the, or all of the construction and demolition debris waste um, that we had accrued from the time we stopped accruing it. Um, so we had previous conversations with them that were based on closure and other items, and there were some miscommunications, but here we are, and we knew that this is something that we had to address. Um, so recently we have done a request for bids, to be clear, <laughs> Uh, or proposals, not qualifications, um, so that we may process and uh, get rid of all of the construction and demolition waste that had been accrued on site for many, many years. And uh, we received two bids. One was from uh, Hammond Grinding and Recycling of Canaan, New Hampshire, and one was from United Construction Corporation of Newport, New Hampshire. Uh, we 
process their bids on a per day basis and per ton basis. And ultimately, when we evaluated all of the information that everybody provided us, um, we did arrive at the decision that uh, United was the low bidder and providing us the best cost proposal. So I'm here tonight asking for authority with essentially a not to exceed $77,800 bid to address the construction and demolition debris pile that's at the solid waste facility. Thanks, Anna. Questions? Dennis, and then we'll go to Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I was thinking that at when we were taking C and D to Lebanon, our, or I know it was a, a vendor that was helping us with that. that I thought that our C and D waste had some value to it when it went to Lebanon because they covered the landfill with it or something. Is, is would that uh, would any of that? If I'm right, would any of that apply to what's happening here with when this all goes to Lebanon? Yep. So there was kind, there was a. Uh, there was a series of changes in a very short period of time. Uh, for quite a while, the material was received by Lebanon um, for $0 as cover material. And while they were evaluating and making changes to their fee structure, those fees increased. Um, so it went from, in the matter of the time that I've been here, uh, four years, it went from $0 per ton to now $12 per ton. And they do still, they are using it as cover material still when they receive it. Okay, thank you. Times have changed. Uh, another question? Um, so we've, we've decided to stop taking CMD now for in the last two years. And what, what puzzles me a little bit about this is that we were able to do that without getting or infringing on the state, you know, because I know at our last visit, uh, the state mandates that we take certain things, but they didn't apparently with C&D waste. So is, is it possible that, well, maybe you don't know this. I just was wondering if we get rid of all this, clean it up as though we were gonna at least semi-close that facility if, if the state's going to come by and say, hey, you can't do that, you've, you've got to take that, you can't, you can't do that, you can't stop this. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. So at this time, we are not required to take construction and demolition debris by the state of Vermont. Um, one of the things that's a really big challenge for us is, once again, um, the City of Lebanon is able to take that um, in their manner of solid waste management. Um, that's significantly less expensive than we're able to manage it. Um, if right now they accept um, unground, so just solid, you know, virgin construction demolition debris, it's over $150 per ton. So our residents, because we have an agreement for them to use the Lebanon solid waste facility can bring their waste, their construction and demolition debris waste to the city of Lebanon for a significantly less amount of money. Um, so it's really hard for us to even consider competing to keep a separate you know, dumpster on site and do the halls. And once again, we can consider having it as a C and D landfill, which is how it was managed in the past. But then we'd have to revisit the idea of having a contractor on site who's going to grind it and haul it over to Lebanon or another facility for us. And then to add some complications, um, both the state of Vermont and the solid waste facilities that receive the construction demolition debris have very stringent requirements about 
um, the, the chip size to which it is ground, the amount of gypsum uh, content which is in it, which is the, uh, we refer to as sheetrock. Um, so it's, there's, there's quite a bit of management involved in CND. Um, so that's something that we have uh, elected at this time not to get involved in again because of the, you know, the commercial, the market around us that we can't really compete. Just one final thought, I think it's final. I just, I still struggle with this, how, how the state can tell us we can't uh, take our stuff to Lebanon, that we have to have our transfer station for certain things. But C and B waste is a major waste. Anybody rebuilding, it's it's bulky, it's big, it's heavy. It has to be ground, as you pointed out, and so forth. And how we're able to do that with this, but not other things. And I I think I said this at our last visit that uh, this seems like a bigger issue for our state reps or something to to help the state make some sense of all this and and allow us to just be able to to go to Lebanon. That seems like the easy, quick, and most efficient solution. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jess. Uh, yeah, Mr. Brown stole 90% of my question, so <laughs> I only have a small part to ask. Um, after this is all done, we still have um, yard waste and tree waste that's in the recycling center, correct? So is that going to be ground as well, or is that... Mm -hmm. That, so that is all included in part of this? As far as this dollar? time, we're only processing. At this time, we're only processing um, and including the items that ha we have received as construction demolition debris, um, because those are the ones that are currently regulated by the state with a two year timeline. Um, so there are some other items on site that we have currently been advised by the state that can be considered as compostable. Um, so we do not have to grind up yard waste? Not at this time. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, Kim, go ahead. Um, when do you think this will happen? If this is approved tonight, I'm going to call the approved bidder first thing tomorrow morning and let them know that they have a notice to proceed. And this is in the 22, um, like contracted services or something, or like where are these funds coming from? So this will be executed in the current fiscal year budget. Um, we're optimistic that because of the staffing shortages in the 20, the current fiscal year budget that we'll be able to cover these expenses. So this is one of those places where unused salary money goes, <laughs> but not as encumbered funds. This is not FY21, this is current live happening right, right. now, FY22. So That's not why I encumbered. asked if it was in 22, in, in yeah. 22, but like I was yeah. looking to find it. Yes. Oh, Hannah has been about three different solid waste people. We, we because we knew this was happening, we didn't fill those positions. So silver lining, we now have the cash available to deal with the CMD pile. That's, this is, those are the questions why I'm always <laughs> asking, where are we using that money for? So this is one of those things. I. Right. Yeah, the okay. giant pile that comes that turns out we really do need to deal with this on a shorter timeline than we realized. We actually are able to um, to have the cash available, mostly because Hannah has not only been the director of public works but the solid waste supervisor for the entirety of this past couple of fiscal years. So yeah, I'm not questioning it. I'm just I helps to understand it better. Um, and then this question, which is probably a little absurd, but uh, we can't grind this C and D and use it for cover for the exist the heart for the landfill that is being closed. We can't just use it ourselves. So I get a lot of questions about um, you know us being a landfill, and I think it'd be helpful tonight if I explained that 
our current operations are that we are a transfer station. And so the difference between a transfer station and a landfill is that in a landfill, um, you know, the Lebanon solid waste facility is a really good example of an active landfill. Um, they have all kinds of technology in place and infrastructure to address active landfilling procedures. They're literally taking waste, they are putting it in a pile, and they are capping it and letting it do its thing for the next 700 years. What we are is a transfer station. We are, um, excuse the term, but we are a middleman. So we take all the waste from 11 towns and commercial enterprises and we collect it and we distribute it to other entities. So whether it's recycling organizations, the Lebanon solid waste facility, whether it's Casella. So we are literally just acting as a collection station and parsing it out to all the appropriate places. So we don't really have a need for like landfill capping material because we're not a landfill anymore. We used to be, we have a current closed landfill. Um, that's actually why if you, know, you look through some of our enterprise funds um, and the audit reports that you'll see that we have a closed landfill fund, um, what that money goes towards is all the appropriate environmental testing, water testing, and any infrastructure needs that we have to meet our state regulatory needs to keep that landfill closed and compliant. So that's kind of like a little bit of a separate op, not separate, but you know, that's a different operation. We are simply a transfer station. Thank you. And I do, I, I think I did understand that, but just because during your budget presentation, we did discuss landfill closure. And so somehow in my mind, and I, I knew it was probably a silly question, but that, oh, is there this closed landfill that we have that we could just put it on top of? But I, I'm pretty sure somebody would have thought of that. So I thank you. I apologize for wasting the time on that question. <laughs> and I, I understand, I definitely understand the difference between our transfer station and what a typical, a standard landfill concept is, but thank you for that as well. Joe, go ahead. I'm glad you asked because I do get asked a lot. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, move that we award a contract to United Construction Corporation to process and remove the construction and demolition debris at the solid waste transfer facility up to the amount of $77,800. Mr. Chair, I'd like to second that. Thank you. Any further questions or discussions, comments? No hands up. Okay. Hearing none, call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 So it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the info as always. Up next is Tree Warden Town Manager information. All right. So um, this is one of those things where I'm just providing some information to y'all. The Tree Warden is 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 your 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 ball's game. I, I don't know how to say that. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, your dance card. I okay. Of course. Um, so you in front of you in your packet, you had a couple of things. You have the current job description um, and the statutes that they have to fall. Um, some of the uh, things the tree board has asked you all to consider is um, whether you feel that the current job description still works. Um, you can also request that I um, appropriate the funding within the current fiscal year to increase the annual budget um, from five to 10,000. Um, and you can also request that I appropriate the funding in the current fiscal year uh, to increase the tree warden's honorarium to $2,500. Currently, I think it's something like 500. Um, so those are the three things that the tree board has been uh, asking of all of you. And um, so we're here to talk about the tree warden. I'll answer whatever questions I can. I'm going to admit that we're all kind of in this together when it comes to tree wardens. Questions or comments? 
Many. I guess my question would be is, uh, have you got a volunteer out there that wants to step up? And <coughs> I have no idea. Um, I know that uh, <laughs> the tree warden prior to the tree warden that resigned um, had been around for quite some time, had chosen to retire like many things. It's a very physical job. Um, and the tree warden who just recently resigned, um, it, it's a big, it's a big job. Um, and the state, I'm sure none of you are going to be surprised, continues to put more on the plate of the tree warden without providing more infrastructure for that position. Um, and so I think that this person just didn't have time with their paying job and their personal life to manage all of the trees and all of the work that's coming down. In terms of if there are people lined up knocking on our door saying, please appoint me to be the tree warden, I don't think so. So, so is there, I don't, know, I don't even know the answer to this question, maybe you don't, but maybe some on the board would. I mean, do we have arborist in the town or a tree trimming company in the town we might be able to reach out to them? I don't know the answer. I, I think Hannah wants to be the tree Yeah. Well, <laughs> Hannah's going to sign up. She's going to plant trees in the solid waste facility. No. Hannah, you have to be a resident to be the tree warden. So you're oh. going to have to give up the farm. You can move. <laughs> Um, so I think it'd be helpful if I provided a little <laughs> extra information on this. Um, so the tree warden is somebody that we rely on. Um, and I know that um, myself as the public works director and the parks and rec director require really heavily on their role um, to go out and evaluate trees to either be um, like a healthy tree that in there was, if there was an instance that we had to cut a tree down that was on public property, uh, the tree warden is required to determine if that tree is hazardous and can be removed or is not hazardous, which it then moves through a public procedure, which I'm not familiar with, and I apologize um, for removal. Um, and, and that's really uh, rooted, <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> um, you know, in making sure that municipalities and governments are keeping a good eye on all of their trees. Um, so at the end of the day, a municipality is looking for someone who has a healthy knowledge of trees and interest in serving the committee and the community um to be able to come in essentially on call that's why there is a stipend associated with it um to be able to you know meet with myself or mr hausler or members of whatever um to you know say yeah this is a tree that is unhealthy it's a hazard to the community or the traveling public or our walking public and should be taken down um, it's a it's a tough role to fill so and no i'm i i doubt that we have anybody on staff that would have that level of knowledge um and also a member of the community that could take that role on unfortunately because it's pretty interesting i have to admit <laughs> and how many hours um a week or a month uh, does this person dedicate to uh, the job? So it's hard for me to answer um, without consulting with uh, Scott Hausler. I know that we call on this person probably easily once every two months to come in and use their expertise to evaluate like whether it's one tree or a stand of trees and understanding that, you know, if we're notified by a member of the public that they have concerns about a tree in the right of way that they perceive as dangerous, um, which we may use our, um, you know, our colloquial knowledge um, to decide that yes, it's dangerous, ultimately by state of Vermont statute, we're required to consult with 
uh, the town's tree warden to decide if that tree needs to come down. Um, so, you know, ultimately the town's the town's at a liability uh, for us to decide if, you know, for, for me to decide if, yes, I, I agree with this citizen, that tree is absolutely a danger. It needs to come down, even if it's common sense. At the end of the day, we are obligated by state statute to have a tree warden on hand to make that decision. Um, so I would argue that it's likely that they are spending a, a bare minimum of eight hours a week doing this service for the town, likely closer to double that, you know, and, and maybe it's good to consult with the past tree warden, um, Mr. Goodkeep, about how much time he spent. I know he's spent a lot of time talking to me about you know, as Lanny mentioned earlier, the emerald ash borer and the plans to address that. So it's it's probably much more than than I know. And I so it's, you know, I don't want to minimize the work that they're doing. That's not fair. And I think some of this is fairly new changes that came down from the state in terms of um, the regulations regarding tree boards and tree wardens and um, I know that the tree, um, our tree board did reach out to people that they knew to see if anyone was interested locally in town. And I, I don't think that anyone stepped up, they didn't find anybody, but that, that they did try that initially. Um, and I don't know whether this document lives, and maybe someone does know if this lives in the charter or not. Um, so if there's anything there, if this is just the state regulations, if there's anything that chart, I'm, I'm not I'm just kind of asking if this has any relevance to the charter, I don't know. Um, all I had was the, and this is what Scott Hausler provided for me, so I'm, I'm going to rely on his expertise on this, is that the, these are the statutes, statutes that not, okay. govern tree wardens. Gotcha. So we don't have to necessarily worry about the charter and changing it that way, which is really my question. So, good. Okay. So, yeah. Any so I got to ask the, the elephant in the room question here. If we cannot find somebody to fill this position, um, we have to hire somebody from, uh, you know, we have to hire an arborist or, I mean, we can't find a volunteer, what do we? I think we have to have one and we have to, we have to have one, yes. But the other weird thing is that is they have to be a resident, correct? So, Hannah, go ahead, help us out here again. <laughs> um. So just want to be like clear in no way is this legal advice, <laughs> but my, my past experience uh, working for the town of Brattleboro and in conferring with Scott Hasler in the past um, is that a, a good way for us to cover our bases until we get somebody who is, you know, willing to take this role on is on a you know as needed basis to contract with somebody who is either a certified arborist or a certified forester to address um, trees in the right of way or on public property that need to be um, that need to be removed for you know whatever reason. Um, and so we were relying on that third party to provide us. Um, third party advice, you know, to cover our bases. Um, Thanks, Anna. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I mean, I think, although that was not legal advice, I think it was excellent advice. So that if there is an opportunity to research potential contractor as well, I mean, it does, especially with the incoming of the emerald ash borer. And I feel like there was another invasive species coming this way as well. I mean, it's, spotted fly or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yes. Um, that, I mean, this is a big responsibility and it will be amazing if we find someone to do it on a stipend. I mean, I, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend bumping the stipend up to $5,000 instead of 2,500 if, the board were amenable to that. I mean, at the very least, um, you know, it's a little bit 
something that seems a little more like it's still volunteering really with a stipend but um anyway it is it is going to be a challenge i think Ms. Kim, Mike, go ahead. just one I, I don't know if anyone knows just something to point out like whether if we don't actually fill this position we have to do something because i mean it looks like the statute says we have to appoint i mean maybe we do an inspector of lumber shingles and wood aware of coal a pound keeper and so if we are if we don't have those you know and it's required by statute i mean i don't think if we don't have a tree warden we're gonna necessarily be violating anything <clears throat> and i'm all in favor of getting a tree warden i'm just <laughs> i'm just saying i don't think we have to go get a contractor necessarily for it i mean we're required to have these other offices and i don't know that we still do maybe we do i think joe I don't know who said it, but it does state that Title 24 states that the select board shall appoint a tree warden from among the legally qualified voters to the town. So yeah, it does have to be a town resident. So I mean, if we get a contractor, we're still not abiding by state statutes. And I, I don't know the answer to this one. I really don't, folks. But I just, I, I, I would suggest maybe you're the liaison for the tree board, maybe reach out to them. And is anybody there qualified to do that or? Yeah, there's not. They've the reached out to us. They help us find somebody. So, so they, we're throwing they, the ball back and forth. Or does the previous tree warden have any recommendations on who he might like to see in that role? I mean, I tap his expertise and say, hey, you got somebody you can recommend that we can snag on to and I, snag on I, to. I think they the have, past. but yeah. I, I don't think anyone, I don't think they came up with anyone. I think they should have researched all that stuff. Yeah, so, but, yeah. Um, yeah. There is one hand up, but also I think my interpretation of if we contracted someone, we would not be, and it was not a Hartford voter, that we wouldn't be appointing that contractor as the tree warden. It would just be that we would still be able to have someone that could tell us, you know, if this, you know, the, the um, have the knowledge to do what the tree warden would do if we had one appointed, but in the absence of one contract service to do it until we got one. But anyway, that's so, you know, and again, I guess we could consult the, um, the LCT or whatever, they might know the answer to that. Um, do you want to take a public comment? Yeah, go ahead. Can you bring Jeff over, Jeff Arnold? Hi. Uh, according to uh, Title 24, it says uh, the select board shall appoint a tree warden who need not be a resident of the municipality. So that settles that question. Doesn't have to be a resident. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, what you got to do is, is, is create the parameters for the tree warden. I mean, as far as uh, honorarium go and term and so forth. And that way we can go, the tree board can go out and start looking for people who uh, would be interested in and have the qualifications to do the job. But, but first you, you got to set the uh, honorarium and set the budget. I mean, the, the, the bigger the $10,000 to replace trees, like for example, on the Queechee Green, it, it's not always hazardous trees that are the problem. On the Queechee Green, we have, um, 10, 10 trees on the green there, and uh, most of them are sick and dying. And it would be the tree warden who would kind of decide what to replace them with. And that's a big eye store right in front of the post office there, right where the uh, balloon festival takes place. So if you can decide tonight on what the budget, I think the budget should be higher for you know, tree, re tree replacement is pretty expensive. You know, it costs about 700 bucks for a two and a half inch diameter tree. So, and, and then the pruning contracts to, to clean up all the uh, dead branches uh, off trees uh, is also expensive. Uh, Brad spent the 5,000 just, just on um, pruning contracts. So if you, you know, if the, I, I was thinking that the honorarium should be paid out once he's expended his budget. That way we know that we're getting our money's worth out of the tree warden. So if, if he's, if he's 
you know, <laughs> or, or maybe half and half or something like that. I mean, it seems like there has to be some requirement before he gets the honorarium. Or she. Like, <laughs> what? Or she. It's the individual, yeah. they're male or female or other gender. Right. Whatever. <laughs> Him, but first you got to create a budget and an honorarium and, and then then we can start searching the tree board uh, can start searching around for people who are qualified and according to title 24 it says that it doesn't have the person doesn't have to be a resident so that makes things easier Jeff, can you say which section is that in because i'm not so what i'm reading says such hold on hold on what I got from the tree board that I gave to you is different than what's on the BLCT tree law FAQ. So I'm on the legislature.vermont.gov and it does say that they do not need to be a resident. But what I got from the tree board is older, it looks like. So ah, that there, we go. It. Okay. there we go, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. And can I ask one more? Yeah. Jeff, are you still on there? Yep. Um, so currently in the 23, 2023, the proposed budget that we're working on, um, there's $12,500 for the tree warden, including the 2,500 stipend. Um, what, what are you suggesting would be the appropriate number there? Well, I think, I think the budget should be increased. He doesn't have to spend it all, but it, it would be, I think 2,500, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of 2,500 to $10,000 is not big enough. It should be that the budget should be more like 15,000 to 2,500 or something like that. Okay, I'm not entirely sure I understand you. So uh, the current proposed amount is like basically 10,000 for pruning and streetscape and plantings and 2,500 stipend for the tree warden. Right. So you said you're suggesting 15,000 for the tree work? For replacement of trees and pruning and uh, taking out dead trees. Like, like you said, the emerald ash borer is, it has hit town. I think the Valley News called me today or something. <laughs> I think they've, they've got the first case, a documented case of EAB in town. And you know we treated all the all the trees on the way to the county courthouse, which are all um, ash trees. Ash trees are are planted municipal on the municipal uh, land leading into the high school, and also in front of Radcliffe Park or some um, some. And some of those we treated this this summer, and it cost us fifteen hundred dollars just to do that. That came out of the rec budget. Uh, we're probably we're not going to try to treat all the trees obviously because it would be too expensive, but we'd like to try to uh, save some of them and, and treat them. The, the treatment lasts for two years. It's a chemical treatment. Can you tell me what your ideal number would be for that line in the budget? 15,000. 15,000 and then plus a $2,500 stipend for the tree warden? Yeah. Or 15,000 total, including the stipend? No, seventeen five. Okay, thank you. Jeff. Okay, so that's and and that can be modified, you know, from year to year. I mean, the budget doesn't have to stay. It, we'll see how that works. If it's too much money, you can cut it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so we now have some guidance there and can figure, um, you know, what we perhaps want to do. I don't know if we want to do something at this meeting. We want to wait until the next meeting, probably, where we can make a motion that's been more performed and worn, so people are aware. How do people feel? I mean, it has been um, so from twenty twenty. The actual amount was forty two hundred four thousand two hundred sixty five dollars. Actual for twenty twenty one. $1,396 and then approved for 2022 was 5,000 and then proposed for 2023, 12, five. 
Um, and so the member of the tree board is recommending that we bump it up to 17.5, including whatever stipend for the tree warden. And I mean, I think because of, I mean, we are about to have an influx of an invasive, at least one invasive yeah. species um, that we may want to just consider. I mean, maybe, I guess it's probably too much to establish a tree reserve probably so that we don't have to, but, or that could be encumbered if it isn't used. We could encumber it if it isn't used. Um, I mean, I think, I think we're going to need some tree attention, but I, you know, and again, and especially like if we have to contract to do some of that work, would that come out of there, do you think, or no? My understanding is that the, the previously, like the tree wardens didn't do major work on their own. They did contract out to move tree to, you in know, from that fund and that money would come from that. I would be supportive of that. Yeah. Okay. So does anyone does anyone feel comfortable making a motion this evening to do that? Or would you rather wait until a further meeting? Why don't we could we bring it to the December 7th meeting where we're gonna do some final, like I have some things to propose as well the seventh that yeah, for the fiscal year 23, totally. Um, I'll, I'll write this down and add it to my presentation, which is currently in draft form for the seventh. Um the thing that um, what I'm hearing from from my staff is just pressure to review the current job description oh, right. <laughs> and all of that stuff for right now because we don't have a yeah. tree warden right now. Um, and and that's where I, I you know I've been able to say that I could identify going from the five thousand to ten thousand and and bring the honorary up to twenty five hundred. That's something that in light research, not wanting to do a ton of it, we could we could manage in this current fiscal year. I think that the job description looks fine in my opinion as it is. Anyone else have any recommendations on the job description? Are we happy with the way it is or I don't know enough to know. <laughs> Just make it quick. <laughs> Sorry. Uh oh just yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Again. <clears throat> so I'm just sitting here thinking how we could address this in another way or whatnot. And so my first thought was, you know, we could hire a tree service, but but a tree service is not. They, they'd probably likely say, you know, it's in their best interest. They probably make the most money of just cut the thing down. And that's not what I want to hear. I, I'd like to hear somebody that has a genuine interest in this that says uh, that can be saved. We can trim it out a little bit and it can be saved or it needs to come down. And so that's the, and, and our trees are very valuable to us all. So I just think that, I just wonder if the 25, we're going to, it sounds like we're going to address this more on the 7th, but uh, to get somebody to, to encourage somebody for 2,500 for this, I'm not sure that, I, I don't know what the magic number would be to attract somebody to, to do this, but yeah, I'm hoping that we'll learn more on the seventh. And, but we, it, it's, I'm very interested in this because this is a value, would be a valuable person to our town. Do we know this is, I hope this doesn't sound as stupid as I'm gonna say it, but, um, do you need to be, I mean, do you, is there training or certification for, for a tree warden? Do we know? I mean, are there qualifications? I mean, how do you become a tree warden? I have no idea. I, I kind of just want to say yes or no on, on the job description and give it a good faith effort to see if somebody steps up to the plate. Might as well try. Yeah. I, I apologize. I don't mean to be sarcastic by saying, make this problem go away, but it's just, it's just, a very difficult problem and it's just one that I don't think any of us here have the ability to solve and uh, maybe we could get a hold of Woodstock or an, another near town to see if maybe we could like tap into the services of their tree board um, might be something worth looking into I mean it's just a this is a it is an issue that we got to deal with if unfortunately it, if it nobody's, doesn't, nobody's got the yeah. answer and if it doesn't have to be a town resident maybe we could have a regional tree board that would serve like two or three towns 
and maybe maybe that's something that we talk to like the environmental, the climate people about to figure out what kind of trees we should be planting for the most oxygen and stuff. You know. <laughs> Joe, Joe's eyes are rolling back. His head. And then there's always the horses. You know, people talked about the horses tonight. Bring in the horses. I'm all for the horses. So another comment. Yes, definitely. I had to laugh when when Hannah was talking about uh, the the free, the previous tree person was chatting with her or something. I, I chuckled to myself because when he he gave us a presentation, I swear it went an hour and a half long or something. It was the nuts and bolts and everything you can possibly imagine. And uh, so, yes, I'm sure he could talk. <laughs> yeah, he was very passionate about his work. Okay, so out there in your daily lives, be on the search for a tree warden. Do we need a motion? For uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we need a motion at this point, do we, for anything? Any discussion? Yeah. You know, I... I didn't know what to do on this one because it's really kind of up to y'all. Um, I mean, did it say, did it say? It just says, no, it's information. It just says informational. <clears throat> but if you informational. Uh, then I think we need to wait. Yeah. yeah. I think we'll just talk, we'll talk about the budget stuff at the next week and maybe by then we'll have some, you know, something, I mean, if we need to revise the, the um, description all or anything for the, Job okay. Or if you need a motion for the job description, can you do that then too? Or do you want to know? You know, I, I need to do some more research. I know that we say like if it doesn't say motion, we don't need to do it, but I don't know, I don't, I don't know that line exactly, but I do know that um the tree board is very anxious to get this started. Um, so I think that there would be um less tolerance to hold on just even for the job description and see if what we can get for a couple of weeks but it's again it's fully up to you guys I mean, we don't typically have but it, because this is a appointee of the board ultimately like that is the only reason we would have to approve a job description like we wouldn't normally approve a job description that you create for staff no but because this is an no and this is the current job description so if if there wasn't any changes this is what likely if there you know this is like any other committee appointment we would just put up what we have mm -hmm. um it'd be like changing y'all's job descriptions i mean yeah, yeah sorry um earlier this evening joe spoke about following procedure so should be following the procedure on this if it requires us to make it wait um, to get more information, then that's the right, right thing to do. So it's, we're going to follow procedure on one thing. We're going to play by the rules. <coughs> um, there's one more. Yes. Right. Uh, can you bring Kathy over? Kathy hey, it's me again, Kathy Malisic. Um, there is a, um, excuse me, there is a frequently asked questions thing for the Vermont Forestry Group that actually says, sorry, I was Googling while you all were talking, <laughs> that says, you know, with consent of the legislative body of the municipality, the tree warden may, item number two, enter into agreements with other municipal corporations to provide tree warden services or training. So you can, I mean, that tells me that you could coordinate with another group and you could share tree warden services. Reach out to Woodstock. And it's under, I mean, I'm happy to send someone the links, Vermont Tree Warden Statutes, updated January, 2021. They were trying to modernize it. I think Tracy's got it up too. Wait. Okay, good. Thanks, Kathy. Well, all right, how about we bring it back on the 14th, but what I'm hearing from all of you casually is no major changes to this job description. So we don't need to do any line edits. I don't need to reprocess it, find the Word document again and all that stuff. I mean, I guess the only other thing would be the standard line of like, you know, potential for other things. I mean, like other that, duties other, as a sign. Yes. <laughs> Do you guys want another comment? Can we, Jeff, back on? Sure. Okay. Yes. Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I, I just wanted to. Uh... To second that uh, that that information, I think is actually in in the job description uh, that that the uh, tree warden has the right to um, make contracts in other towns and, and and get paid for those services or something like that. So, and I think Windsor has a tree warden. So we, in the interim, maybe we could talk to that person. 
And as far as qualifications, you might want to add some qualifications to the d- job description. You, I mean, they, sh- they should have a, forest, a, a background in forestry, although I don't even think Brad had a background. I think he, would, he, he was just a hobby for him. So you can get really good people who are just hobbyists, but uh, uh, you might want to put it in a description. And then there might be a tree warden descriptions out there like Middle, Middlebury and uh, St. Albans. They, I think they have paid tree wardens. So I can look up in the interim, I can uh, try to find a tree warden uh, job description, and send it over to you. Sounds great, thank you, Jeff. If you guys are gonna change this, uh, the board packet for the 14th is uh, absolutely deadline, deadline, deadline. Uh, Lana needs everything by 9 a.m. Friday the 10th. So we're, we're working on a short deadline and I think, I think all of us who are left in this room are pretty toasted on the last couple of months. So uh, we're trying to move quickly, but you know, the, the processing of these board packets, we're pretty tired. So more time is better. Thanks, a reminder. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to um, COVID nineteen vaccine and masking. We thought we would save the easiest thing <laughs> for last. Um, so a couple of updates. When this went on the agenda originally, we were looking at the OSHA emergency temporary standard, which had a lot of vaccination and testing requirements. Um, and that's the update y'all were going to get. Um, but it has been stayed by the U.S. Court of Appeals Fifth Circuit. And um, we're getting the guidance to um, just monitor the situation, not to develop a plan until we see where that goes. Um, it's sage advice. We don't have a ton of staff just hanging out, waiting to develop plans for things that may or may not come to fruition. So uh, we're just all keeping an eye on it. The department heads have given me feedback. Um, they're staying in contact with their colleagues and other municipalities um, and their professional organizations. Um, and when and if that uh, ETS moves forward at that point, we will probably dig in deep um, administratively and comply with that ETS. So. That's where we're at on that. Um, And then uh, the act relating to temporary municipal rules in response to COVID-19 came up. Um, So this happened on the Monday before Thanksgiving. Um, Both the House and Senate passed this bill, which allows local municipalities to enact local face covering ordinances. Um, As you all can imagine, the Monday before the Thanksgiving holiday was a really terrible time for this to happen not just for all of us sitting in the room, but for boards and staff around the state. Um, So VLCT uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday came out with some uh, model legislation as well. Um, And your agenda memo has some of the kind of baseline stuff about the municipal rule and two uh, kind of bare bones um, provisions that Brattleboro had initially drafted up Um, when this was coming down the pipeline that other municipalities like us borrowed. Uh, One change from my memo, uh, the law doesn't provide any guidance on how or when they can enforce the rule. VLCT has since uh, provided clarity on that and one of their uh, model ordinances does have an enforcement option. So uh, that's on the table if you all would like to discuss that as well. Um, and I'm here for you with some model ordinances and as much facts as I have on an emergency situation. And go ahead. So the, there's also the third option, which is to do nothing and leave it as we have it. So we, we don't have to enact either one of these, right? We can continue with the fact of asking people to mask up if they're unvaccinated, such as we've been doing now. Um, I don't think that's, to me, I would rather go that route, but uh, I hate to see us mandating people to put on masks because the people that are already wearing masks are going to wear masks. The people that are not wearing masks, they're not going to wear masks. So mandating, I don't think it's going to really change it unless there's more teeth to this thing than 
that we're currently aware of. Uh, just my opinion on it. Thanks, Bud. Thank you again. I I am not set on either any of these options. I, I I'm perfectly comfortable about uh, wearing a mask myself. I'm. Um, I do wonder. Uh, we've gone through. Now we got a new variant of this virus. Who knows where that's going to head? But we went through the whole thing of not mandating a mask rule. We suggested it and encouraged it, but we didn't. We went through the whole thing in the last year and a half or so without doing that. No, the state had a mandate. There was a state mandate during the, the state of emergency. Okay, well, it's. I did, I guess Sorry, I either the, forgot or didn't know that. The but. day before we were going to vote whether or not Hartford should be, sorry to interrupt, I apologize, but um, the day before we were going to vote whether or not Hartford should enact one, the Governor Scott had, did issue a state mandate from like whatever was uh, April 1st to the end of the state of emergency. Well, thank you for that. Um, I learned a lot from you. <laughs> Same. Uh, the subject of enforcement came up. You know, if we did have this mandate, you know, and people went into a store or somewhere that didn't have one who enforces or what, I, I know that I read through quickly, read through, uh, you know, what penalties and how do you do that and whatnot. Um, I noticed a lot of folks that wear masks pull them down to talk. And, and that's, puzzling to me because I, if you pull your mask, if you're wearing one, you pull it down, it seems like game over, you're, you're, it's exposure. So you either got to wear it or not. And, and that's what I'm struggling with there. So that's just my thoughts. Yes, Joe, go ahead. I'm, I'm not um, listening in favor of mandates. We have um, entities um, of large gatherings within Hartford, i.e. the co-op, uh, King Arthur, restaurants, Revolution, UVAC. King Arthur's in Norwich. I'm sorry? King Arthur's in Norwich. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's yeah. The warehouse is um, here. Um, that they, um, they are requiring masks. And so I am, I just have a, problem with mandating it and having if we mandate it in the convenience store and someone were $13 an hour having to um, enforce that and it just it's, it's very difficult and putting people in very difficult situations and um, I, I don't know if and the enforcement um, just like Dennis said is something that um, I'm not necessarily comfortable with or if it's even possible. So um, I just um, was in Buffalo um, in Erie County is mandating it and uh, in, in uh, Western New York and it is become a mess and you know and how people are enforcing it and uh, police being called and it, it's just an absolute mess. So I, I I do not want that for an already stressed um, uh, public safety department. So I am uh, I'm against the mandate. Mike, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, just a couple thoughts. Uh, you know, I would think of the two sort of you know potential resolutions here. Like, if we were going to take any time to debate and actually vote on one, I would vote on. I think it would be more worthwhile to debate whether to require it or not. This other one of encouraging everyone is encouraged by the federal government, the state to wear a mask, you know? So I think that that one just, I just don't even really see the point of doing it. So, I mean, if we want to talk about one of these resolutions, you know, I'd be willing to, to listen on the merits for actually request uh, requiring one. Um, I do think, you know, and I'm not necessarily in favor of a, a mandate, but I do think it would probably put some people who are on the fence into wearing um, masks. You know, if we had a mandate, I'd be wearing a mask right now. I think we all would. Um, and, you know, certainly if we adopted it, I wouldn't want an enforcement mechanism. I think the fact 
that's just asking for too much trouble. You know, it, these things can in some way enforce themselves. If you go into a store and everyone's wearing a mask, you're more likely to wear it. It's just, it's just what people do, you know? So I don't think you would need any outside enforcement, but you know, if we're not willing to take that step, I don't, I don't really see a great point in just passing something to encourage people to wear it. That's everyone knows they're supposed to wear a mask. This has been encouraged by everyone for like two years, you know? So I don't even know if it's really worth the time unless we're willing to, to, to debate an actual mandate. And, you know, I don't know. I'd listen to that debate on the merits, but I don't know in the end how I'd vote on it, to be honest. Kim, anything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's me. Um, and I know, but I, uh, this, I think if, if I were in a close conversation with someone, I would not pull my mask down. I don't, I'm a few feet away from Mike, but I feel like there's a little social distance element as well. Um, and I will say as an, as an individual person, not as a representative of the town, I don't have a strong preference. And I really, uh, you know, I do require masks in my business. Many of the businesses in Hartford do. Um, I clearly there was no way to do an official poll, um, but I did do an informal outreach just within the business community that I work with on a regular basis. And I sent out emails to 67, um, I think primarily White River Junction businesses. I don't think it included any. Well, there was at least one Quichi business on there. Pat, Pat. Um, and I received from that email 23 responses, 19 were in favor, four were opposed. Um, of the 19 in favor, most were very strongly in favor and stated why. Um, the four opposed, uh, one or two may have been strong. Actually, I don't know that anyone was strongly opposed. Everyone was sort of, you know, like they're tired, they're, they're in a restaurant, they don't want to be, you know, they, and, you know, clearly when you know, there are exceptions for when people are eating and drinking. Um, also, did just some individual outreach in conversation. And um, I don't think I got everyone, but generally speaking, there were about seven in favor and four opposed in that little informal survey. But again, this is just conversations with people in the community. And um, I think that uh, because of the things that I think are sort of pushing me to being in favor of a mandate, a temporary mandate that with, and in fact, um, I think if we do adopt either of those proclamations, I would wanna make some adjustments just to the language about the effective uh, period um, to clarify it a little bit more. Um, but because we are, we're in winter season, if this were the beginning of June, we're more, outdoor options were available. We're going the holiday season where more people are traveling and gathering in for bigger groups. There is a new variant um, that we are not fully aware of. Um, so I feel like a responsibility to say, please consider just I mean, we've been dealing with this for so long. It is a pain. It's uncomfortable. It is no fun. You know, especially if you're someone who has to wear it all day long uh, in public, and um, and so I feel like I feel an obligation to vote in favor of a temporary mandate because of those circumstances. That's good. Is um is Ali there? Does Ali have any comments? I do. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I had my hand raised. Um, I think um, I had a, some similar thoughts to, to Kim on this, and I also didn't get a chance to formally poll folks in any kind of concerted way just with the timing, but from sort of the informal sense I was getting, it, it seemed to me that there are um, at least a few more in favor of a mandate versus no mandate. Um, I agree with Mike that sort of the, the middle ground of a, we strongly recommend won't necessarily um, create more change than, you know, actually mandating something or not. Um, so I would I would be in favor of you know going the strongest route one way or the other um, just for for clarity of expectations for for the community um, and I think I'm leaning more personally towards a mask mandate both just because what I've heard from the community and then also 
um, tracking cases in Windsor County so far, which, you know, any sort of rise in cases is, is alarming. Um, to Kim's point, we do have another variant, which I don't think is cause for panic necessarily, but is certainly cause for, um, you know, just being aware and being diligent. Um, and, you know, when I'm thinking about this issue, um, you know, I'm trying to um, weigh, obviously, the advice of public health experts. Um, and I think there was a, a meta-analysis that came out recently, which pulled a lot of um, kind of results from a lot of different studies on the efficacy of masks. And I think it's something where like 53%, definitely don't quote me on this and do, you, <laughs> do your research. Um, but from what I saw, I think it's about 53% of um, in terms of the, the efficacy of um, diminishing the spread of COVID-19 when folks are wearing masks, um, in addition to, you know, other uh, measures as well. So um, I think masks are effective um, and we have data to, to show that. And I'm also thinking about, you know, the, um, you know, risk analysis of, of, of harm, you know, in both situations of, you know, not wearing masks, not mandating masks or mandating them. And, um, you know, I think if we were to mandate them, there doesn't seem, you know, to be any um, harm for folks beyond a minor inconvenience um, to wit to have folks wear a mask versus if folks are not wearing a mask that does have the potential, you know, to spread a deadly virus and, and to cause harm. So um, I know it's it's this this virus is hard, right, because you can't see transmission happening in real time. Um, so it's hard to know how your actions, you know, on the ground are affecting people. But um, I would be, I think I would be in favor of um, certainly a temporary mandate, you know, this would be in effect for 45 days and then after which point we could reevaluate. And I think what we've sort of been hearing from public health experts is that we should be expecting these sorts of ebbs and flows, that there's going to be a surge and then that might require more caution. Um, and then if we do our due diligence, we might see cases go down and we can relax measures. And I think we just I know it's really, really hard and we're all so tired, but I think we have to just be willing to, to go with the flow and to be able to adjust accordingly. Um, I would also, uh, in, in looking at the language um, proposed in both um, versions of a resolution, um, I think we could, I think it was Tracy, the VLCT memo that you offered or VLCT guidance had some language around some exceptions which I think maybe we could work in. I know currently in the resolution language, it's already says children under two years um, and VLCT had some language around also um, perhaps folks who have a disability um, who can't wear a mask safely or who that's um, a challenge for. I would, I would opt that we would um, include that language. I know that can be challenging for folks um, with disabilities. Um, and, and otherwise, you know, folks who might have um, be put at risk um, by wearing a mask. So I would I would want to um, maybe think about some of the language of the exceptions, but um, I'd be in favor of a mandate. Thank you, Ali. <clears throat> I'm a couple of oh, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Dan. Just <laughs> one more thing after listening to um, to Ali. I mean, yeah, I guess there are a couple things about this which are just sort of frustrating. You know, one is you know, I haven't really heard one way or the other from from people in town, like, you know, how they're feeling about this. So, I mean, um, you know, that's, you know, that's just, that's just what that is. But the other thing is like, you know, if, if I were going to vote in favor of a requirement, I'd, I'd vote for language that was not necessarily this language. Um, I'd like to see some like changes to it. So I don't know if that's something we really want to hash out, like if, this hour or if or if we can you know work and get you know other language on it to look at another time i don't know just thoughts you know right and a couple of things um and this could have changed as this ebbs and flows i'm not sure but the last i heard was that school districts can have different policies from the towns as well so that could potentially be confusing depending upon what the which route the school district goes or is at um, and I read a comment, I think it was in the paper in the last couple of days about, um, I don't know who the person was, but it's a comment about how Lebanon and Hanover do have mask ordinances and they're not comfortable going there because they want the right to not do that. So they like coming to this side of the river, which is very unusual because most people go to the other side of the river to shop for those kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, there's no question about the science behind this, but um, um, you know, I'm disappointed that when we had an emergency order from the governor, it was, much easier to follow. I feel like it's been, you know, this has been 
kicked down to us at this level. Um, and now we're all scrambling as towns and fighting within ourselves to make some people happy. I think the businesses that are in town um, that have a mask ordinance have put that in place. Um, I do want to be sensitive to people, as I think Ali said, with disabilities. But I also know that um, you know some disabilities are not visual. So someone may have a disability that can't be seen and therefore not have to wear a mask and will be harassed when they go in somewhere where they're required to have one. Um, you know, having a business not in this town, but even when there's an emergency order, um, people throw things at you, people swear at you. Um, all those things have happened to me personally. Um, so I, even with an emergency order in place, that happens. So without an emergency order at the state level, I think we're dealing with something that's going to be very, very difficult to enforce, as Lanny said. Um, you know, we could put those rules in place, but I think that's just going to cause more havoc. The people that are going into a convenience store are going to go in for five minutes, and by the time you argue with them, they'll purchase what they want, and they're gone. The people that are going to a play and sitting there maybe for two or three hours um, sort of know what they're getting into in those places, have a mask ordinance if they choose to do so, and, and people know that. And, you know, as people have brought up, we're not new in this pandemic, and, and the people that um, don't want to be out in public at, or want to be out in public as little as they need to know that. And if they have to go out in public, they go um, to at times of days when it's not as busy and they make sure they wear a mask. So I, I just think we're setting ourselves up for failure um, to require a mask ordinance, not knowing what the surrounding towns are going to do or how that's going to change at this time. I mean, um, there's nothing presenting that, preventing us from putting this on the agenda again next week and another month. But I, I just, as much as I believe in, in the mass and stuff, I just don't think it's something that, that we can reasonably enforce. And I think that it's just going to cause more headaches than not. I mean, the businesses, um, since the emergency order has been lifted, if they choose to have a, have a mask ordinance for their establishment, they do. Um, and we can support those businesses that want to do that and recommend. And I don't know how those individuals are handling the customers that come into the store that don't wear one. I'm sure there's a the whole spectrum, but I feel it takes sort of the onus off of us with something that, that I don't feel we can reasonably enforce. Um, so that's that's my personal opinion. So if someone wants to, to make yeah. a motion, have a comment, we can continue. So we'll go to Lanny and then I'd like, like to make a motion if I could. Well, let's... Uh, we have two people. Okay. 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 Yeah. No. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Den Dennis, go ahead. No, I was going to move. Okay. So sorry, I forgot about the thank you, Kim. So we'll bring whoever's no, first. Thank you. Uh, you please you bring can. William Mayfield, Brett Mayfield. Yeah. Brett, go ahead when you're ready. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, the mask or non-mask, but I thought I'd just give you um, today's sort of uh, update, you know, and, and I'm sure some of you um, are aware of that. So the uh, Hart or Windsor County's um, above 4%, uh, which is actually uh, just slightly above 4%, which is still for our area, um, it's still pretty good, <laughs> but 4% is getting up there. The uh, the state is uh, as of today, uh, for those that didn't hear, is uh, four point five. Um, at five percent, the the governor and and you know uh, the uh, uh, you know the the other entities uh, within the state will then um, relook at the total uh, outlook of of uh, the spread of coronavirus in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, we're, we're five percents away and uh, the count right now, as everybody heard, is low because of the holidays. So, you, you know, nobody knows, but um, but we're creeping right up there. Um, and that that would you know, that would be something that the state would, you know, then move forward on, um, you know, on a probably a state, you know, a, a whole state um, um, mandate of some sort. Um, Again, you know, the the governor's office, as well as the Department of Health, uh, who does support masking indoors. Um, but the governor's office, you know, is is trying to push um, vaccines, which we know um, is the way to get through the pandemic at some point. Um, and that's that's their goal at this point uh, as of today and has been. So I just wanted to give everybody where we're at. Um, uh, uh, um, Grafton County uh, is higher. I think most of you are aware, but a lot of the uh, a lot of that data is coming from the outskirts of Grafton County. Uh, but that doesn't mean, of course, that it's it's not everywhere. And 
And of course, you know, with the new virus that's in the world, uh, you know, eventually it will show up. It's in Canada. It will. It has not, as of today, showed up. Uh, but that could change things, and it may not change anything at all. Uh, that'll be about a week to two weeks before anybody really knows. So all those things that are out there are just a lot of guesses right now. So I think that was just I wanted to give everybody as much data as today as as possible. Uh, I think everybody also might have heard that um, in when the first mass mandates uh, were put out. Um, they the response uh, throughout the country and 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 Vermont uh, were quite good uh, and mass mandates and the Delta variant uh, those st uh, states uh, that have mass mandates it is dropped off uh, to lower than forty percent <laughs> so um, you know it's it's a lot of frustration and and I you know I know everybody's brought up you know how hard it is to um, you know, and, and just to let it, you know, I think some of you know and some of you don't, but I was sort of the key person out there <laughs> for, you know, when the mandate was in to try to urge, uh, you know, people along. And, and for the most part, uh, it was good. But, you know, some, you know, sometimes it, it you know, it did get uh, confrontational. And, and, and again, that wasn't what we were trying to do. So, you know, we would simply back off on that and try to get people to do it. But, um, you know, I, I think that was the data I had for everybody today. And, and uh, um, yep, I think that's it. Thank you. We appreciate that information. Thanks for the update. Okay, so one more. Okay, let's do Ali and then Becky. Sure. Thanks. Um, I, I'm just wondering, because um, I, I hear folks on the um, enforcement level, and that's, that's definitely kind of my big concern as well. And I guess I'm wondering from, from you, Tracy, if, if you've heard um, any concerns from, from town staff around this. Like, you know, I know VLCT recommended some options for what enforcement might look like in terms of, a, is it a ticket or is it something else? Um, so I don't, I don't know if you've heard um, from other, other folks on staff about their concerns or their feelings from an enforcement perspective. Uh, they are holding the line and waiting for you all to make this decision, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll discuss it later. Sorry, sorry, folks. Got it. No worries. For you. Okay, great. And who did you say it was Becky? Yeah. Okay. Bring Becky. Go ahead when you're ready, Becky. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, so this is Becky Chalet, uh, resident of Hartford. I'm also a licensed naturopathic physician. I practice um, and I have a private practice in Hartford. And I also served on the Hartford Ad Hoc Committee on um, Coronavirus Response last year or up until whenever it was terminated, I believe in June of 2021. Um, I'm, I just wanted to voice my opinion that I would... Uh, well, I first of all regret that the governor is not taking leadership on this issue again, um, and that he's kicked the can down to the municipalities. I think that's really unfortunate because I think as Chairman Fraser said, it, it puts the towns in awkward positions, but um, I would strongly encourage Hartford to consider uh, passing a mandate requiring masking indoors. Um, and part of it is is based on the science that we know it's very clear evidence that masks help prevent the spread of of uh, the coronavirus. Um, and I, the messaging has been really botched since uh, we all got excited that we were vaccinated and from a federal and, and state um, agencies basically told us, well, you're vaccinated, you can, you can stop wearing masks. And they've been very slow, uh, particularly at the state level to be clear now that they're actually recommending everyone be masked. So uh, I will say as a, as a healthcare provider and as an individual, I don't go anywhere where people aren't masked. So I will not attend a select board meeting in person because the vast majority of the people in the room are not masked. And I, I think it's a big mistake that the, that the town isn't modeling what the state is recommending. And I, and I think that we, it's a disservice to the businesses not to support them by mandating the masking. I remember back when we went through this 
iteration, the first iteration, businesses were begging the town to pass pass a mass mandate. And we on the coronavirus committee were constantly getting asked by businesses to please, please convince the town to pass a, man, pass a mandate. So um, I, I also, I mean, the committee is, is no longer and I'm not involved um, in communicating with businesses, but I, I think it is more supportive to pass a mandate than it is to leave the entire responsibility on the business owners themselves. Um, and in terms of enforcement, that was not particularly an issue when the state mandated it. They didn't choose to enforce it. And by and large, what, what happened is that if a business or an, um, an entity was having trouble with someone refusing to mask, they just called the police and it, was, it could be a trespassing issue if they really felt like they needed intervention or enforcement. So anyway, I would encourage you guys to, to pass a mandate. Becky, uh, anyone else on the Nope. Okay. We'll move a motion and see where it goes from there. So I'd like to make the motion to have the town of Hartford continue with its current standards of asking those that have not been vaccinated to wear masks and those that have been vaccinated may or may not wear a mask at their own discretion. Is there a second? Did you repeat that? <laughs> like, okay, the motion to have a town of Hartford continue with its current standards uh, of asking those that have not been vaccinated to wear masks and that those that have been vaccinated may or may not wear a mask at their own discretion. Any clarification? I don't think we currently have a standard. We don't, we don't have a- We have a standard on our door. For the town hall. Yeah. But it's not, it's not a town. Well, we look, it's like so we're looking for, okay, so, we need a motion to not do anything. Is that? I mean, I'm not sure. I, think, what, I don't think we need a motion. We'll just continue yeah, where we are. So we don't, we don't need a motion. To, so it's. I mean, it, it's called for motion required. So I'm not sure how we. Well, can we just not make a motion? Well, I'm going to make one. Yeah. Okay. But I'll wait if you're. So is there you a second to Lanny's well, no, I, I, I would draw my motion. Then. Like, I would draw my motion. We can do it this way. Um, so I probably don't need to go too into. Why? Why you thinking? Of that, I, I was just going to make a motion that we recommend you wear a mask. That was my plan, but not with doing the whole proclamation about it. I I, I don't even know what that means. Well, there's two, there were two sample proclamations, and is that what we were called? I, not a I didn't get a chance to read them. Okay, but in short, I was just going to say that we recommend this. Let's see what Kim had before, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. Yep. I mean, this isn't yep. going to go far, I don't think. But um, <laughs> uh, so I move that the town of Hartford enact a temporary uh, resolution requiring wearing face coverings as presented in the packet with a um, minor modification that the effective period, the last paragraph, say the resolution shall remain in effect for 45 days or until the Hartford Select Board rescinds or extends the rule or until what was it, April. You can't do that. The state law says 45 days, and then you have to come back and do every 30 days until April 30th. Right. Okay, I'll just leave it as is. I, I, the section B of Act One made it sound like we had to say it differently because uh, okay, so so forget my minor amendment. Uh, basically, I moved that the Hartford Select Board approve the resolution requiring wearing face coverings in the town of Hartford as presented in the agenda packet. Is there a second? Allie, your hand up like you just did. I would. Hi, yeah. Um, I might offer, I guess, in a in addition, I would second that with maybe, this is where it gets complicated because it's another kind of revision of the language potentially, but um, with with Kim's recommendation to the change of the language as well as um, incorporating exceptions as stated in VLCT's model face covering rule guidance, 
which I will <laughs> read out loud. Um, so um, to ex examples of exceptions, to the requirement to wear facial coverings that the legislative body may choose to add to its rule may include, but are not limited to children under two years, a person with a disability who cannot wear a face covering or cannot safely wear a co face covering for reasons related to the disability, um, a person for whom wearing a face covering would create a risk to workplace health, safety, or job duty as determined by the workplace risk assessment and or a person while eating or drinking inside any establishment that serves food or beverage. A friendly amendment accepted and we can just copy that. I mean, if this goes anywhere, we can okay. We'll figure it out administratively. Yeah, I'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a motion a second on the table. Any other questions or comments? I, I would just say, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't rule out ever voting for a, a mandate based on the circumstances, but I, I can't support, you know, what was written in the packet. And I, you know, I, I'm just not comfortable supporting, you know, an amendment uh, at this stage, so. Okay, so let's call the question. Let's do other comments. So all in favor, aye. 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 Two in favor, all opposed. Aye. Okay, so two in favor and five opposed. Can I, can I ask a follow-up or, or or is discussion over at this point? You can ask not, yes and no. You can you can <laughs> make another motion or ask for clarification. I don't think you can really ask about something we already finished discussing my understanding but i don't know but go ahead okay well you can you can tell me if i'm on base and i'll i'll rescind my question if needed but um would would we be able to um to, you know to mike's point about not being able to support this as written um would we want to put it on a future agenda like with some revisions to language to like to to revisit a resolution that has different language that we might be more interested in i think we could yeah definitely i think that's yeah we certainly could do that and that's the beauty of this is we could put this on the agenda every week for till spring until april um and the governor may change things but i mean i have to say that i didn't hear from one person one way or the other about how they felt so i'm kind of feeling like people are sort of okay with what we have no, we um, got some I, mean, emails. I mean yeah <laughs> i mean other than this evening and some emails but yeah. there wasn't like there wasn't a a mass majority of people that said, I definitely want a mask ordinance or I definitely don't. It was just like, eh, you know, no one, no one's really quite sure because, you know. I'm happy to read to you from some of the emails I got from business owners at any point if yeah. anyone is interested. Yeah. Because I mean, I think there were, you know, the idea of um, individual businesses being able to require, I mean, thank goodness that that's a possibility. Right. And right. we're still, you know, everyone, each is dealing with their own manner of enforcement or not, um, you know, and the um, even we are in the upper valley where we're close to, to Hanover and Lebanon. Um, there are employees making minimum wage in both in Hartford and Hanover and Lebanon, some of whom are asking are being asked to enforce mass mandates without the support of the town follow up. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm completely content with where we are and I'm disappointed, but it's bound to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're all open ears here in terms of, you know, over the next week, if something drastic happens, I mean, I think we're all a little bit disappointed from, you know, hopefully I heard this correctly, but with, with the state of Vermont not pushing this down to our level and making us make sort of making us the bad guys or the good guys, depending on how you look at it. I mean, it, it, it seems, you know, we had an emergency order before, which I think was a good thing to make things more consistent. And, and that's, um, you know, I, I think that's, that would have been a much easier way to do it. So. Easier for us, yeah. Yeah, and easier, and it would be consistency in the state. Yeah. You know, and I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes wonder about the efficacy of everything. If, if the towns are just a patchwork, you know, I know right. when you go into a town where no one masks and you go into one where, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it would have been nice to get some leadership from the state if it's, you know, like if this is a serious enough problem, just mandate it for everybody. That's probably the better public health outcome than having a patchwork of towns, you know, to all do stuff differently. So, Joe, we can say something. No, I was just I was asking um, Kim. We were you saying that uh, in Lebanon and Hanover that the town, that those particular municipalities, were not supporting the 
the, those uh, employees? No, they are. But I'm saying so. If you're if you're working in a gas station in in Lebanon mm -hmm. for thirteen dollars an hour, you're you're still having whether you have the, the town's backup or not, you're still having to deal with enforcement on some level or another. Yeah. And same here, like you know, I think um, Jake's in Hartford Village, I think, is requiring masks still, and you know, those they don't have the backup of the town. They don't have that. Well, it's not my fault. It's the town, or it's not my fault. It's my boss. Or, right. You know, like yeah. it is. It's all. I mean, I have no problem. And we have, as an individual <laughs> sure. business, we have had very few um, encounters of people upset, but we've had some people just walk out, and it's okay too. So. Um, I don't think you to please all the people all the time is what I've figured out. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so on any issue. Especially in a pandemic. Right. Anything else? All right, let's go on to commission reports. Maybe we'll start at this end this time. Kim, do you have anything? Uh, well, as Dennis mentioned, there was planning commission had a special workshop last night about the RV regulation, the proposed for modifying the RV regulations. Um, there was extensive discussion and um, basically commission members requested some additional information um, from the emergency shelter committee to bring back to them things about defining plots of land and defining, you know, if there were to be an end limit to the number of times. So that's ongoing. And I think that they'll, they'll come back again. Um, Harper revolving loan is tomorrow. The, uh, yeah. And then they're also planning commission and design review are still kind of working through that. Um, they have a planning commission has a meeting on the sixth about a uh, couple applications, but also that the demolition of a historic building issue that's been a kind of a hot topic. That's all that I can think of. I mean, it is. it's heated. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Mike, go ahead. I don't really have anything. The school board met at the same time we did last week. So it's really difficult <laughs> to attend. Yeah, exactly. All right. Joe. I don't have anything. Allie. Oh, sorry. Um, Kim shared my uh, update regarding emergency shelter um, and um, yep so just just to add on to that um, after the um, this working session we'll probably have another um, uh, kind of feedback meeting and, and planning meeting to uh, incorporate some of that feedback um, with the planning department and then do a second working session warned working session um, uh, with the planning commission so those are the next steps on that and I don't have uh, updates on the others. Thanks, Sally. Sorry, I'm, no, I'm, sorry. I'm nothing. Nothing. I just forget about Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Historic Preservation Committee. Um, so there were some concerns in the recent uh, uh, meeting about their relationship to the Planning Commission. And I, uh, as far as communication, it was it's been said that they're advisory to the planning commission but it's become apparent that their their message or their thoughts aren't being conveyed to the planning commission so i i encourage them to examine their charge and and uh, just see what their what's in their purview as far as doing that and communicating with planning so they're going to work on that i believe then they met again uh, while we heard about their grant that they applied for tonight. And um, the, the, uh, there was some good work about the topic that came up for the CLG grant tonight about the, the entertainment, the theater, whatever that they're, they're gonna examine with this new grant. And uh, so that was kind of vague, but as work transpired, um, the questions of, okay, so we got we had the theater here. How did they get here back then? How did, where did they eat? Where did they stay? And that sort of thing. So it evolved. And I, I found that very interesting and I was glad of their work on that. That's all I have. Energy Commission, as we said, is looking for members. We're looking for Tree Warden. The Emerald Ash Borer is unfortunately here. That's what I have. Great, sure. um, consent agenda. I didn't get to. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's one of the, there's one thing I did not read the whole thing. So anyway, um, 
Mr. Chair, I move that Select Board approve payroll ending November 27, 2021, meeting minutes of November 16 and November 23, 2021. The AP manifest of November 26 and 11th and uh, November 30th, 2021, and select board meeting dates of December 7th, December 12th, and January 14th. Uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, December 14th, 2021, and January 11, 2022. And, and approve the select board chair to sign the manifest for December 22nd and 28th. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. And Joe, any questions or comments? Uh, just that if anyone else really wants to do the thing, <laughs> like, I don't know. Joe and I have you, text, you, you. It is, you two are doing a fantastic okay, job. <laughs> okay. Uh, no questions or comments. We'll call the question. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you. And so we'll now entertain a motion to um, adjourn. So Thank move. Yes. So, so move from Kim. Second by Second. Lanny. All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, thank you. Kim Lanny, tenor.